Christian, you there? I am here and we are live. We're live on YouTube right now? Yes, we are. We can unlive it if you'd like. Oh, I think I'm good with being live. I'm getting feedback from your, I think from your computer, from the YouTube. You still there? Yes. Cool. I can't see you, your video is off, I think. Christian, you there? I'm here, yes. Ready to go. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, I'm going to share slides just to check one last time and see how that goes. Let me, let me make sure you are a co-host. Good. Now, if I, um, I think if I play my YouTube live stream, I get feedback. Let me check that. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it now. Okay. Yeah, I'll just keep my YouTube live feed off because it's confusing. <laughs> I think it's playing through my headphones. Um, okay. Let me share here and see if this works. Can you see that? Christian, can you see my slides? I can, yes, we are set. Good, all right. I'm gonna just leave that up and we are, what, 10 minutes from showtime, yeah? Correct. Okay.
Christian, you there? I'm here. All right. Well, we, I think we should uh, try to get started here, just even if it's a couple minutes short of the official start. Um, am I good to go? We are good to go. Okay, welcome everybody um, to Dynamic Walking 2021, episode one. Uh, I'm Greg Sawicki from Georgia Tech. And um, I'd li also like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Christian Hibiki from Florida A&M and Florida State University who co-organized with me this year. Um, we're pretty excited, even though we're in virtual format, we tried to shake things up a little bit this year. This is the 16th annual meeting of Dynamic Walking. Um, started out in about 2006 in Ann Arbor, and every year since, we've been meeting around this time of year to talk about leg locomotion. This year, we, given that we're in, in the pandemic uh, and we could not meet physically, we decided that right following last year's virtual meeting, which was, uh, which was the last minute decision that we would try to plan out a, um, a, a multi-episode series this year to kind of touch on more aspects of dynamic walking in general and spread the, spread the time out over more than one full day meeting. We're all a little bit Zoom drained at the end of this year. And so that's what we're, we're going to do today. Um, let's see if I can advance here. The plan is that uh, right now, May 20th is episode one. We're gonna focus on biomechanics. Each of these episodes, you should get these on your calendar if you haven't, are gonna be about four hours, combination of talks and also spatial chat posters with some panelists. The next one's June 11th, that'll be episode two on neural control. And then in July, episode three on tasks and objectives. I wanna quickly acknowledge here the organizing team that really helped put this together, both at Georgia Tech and, in, in, and down in Florida. Jenny Listma, uh, Lindsay Trejo, and Owen Beck from, from the Power Lab at Georgia Tech, who handled all the website, the messaging, um, uploading abstracts, a lot of the on-the-ground logistics, with, with strong help from Tianze Wang and Jacob Hackett at Florida State. And just want to quickly outline what we're going to do today. Um, hopefully you guys have seen the schedule on Twitter and out there in, in the internet universe. But we're going to start with a short, a panel of short talks. Um, there'll be a break, another panel of short talks, and then there'll be a panel. And the, end of the day will end with a hangout in, over in spatial chat um, for posters. If you haven't already, let your friends know about the live stream that's happening right now on YouTube. You can see that link here. And I think um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the moderator for session one, Dr. Sasha Voloshnia from UC Irvine. She's just started her, her position as an assistant professor there. Sasha's been around the dynamic walking community for a long time. Started out in Dan Ferris's lab studying um, stability and the energy cost associated with moving in, in uneven terrain. And I recently finished a postdoc with Steve Collins working more on robotics, uh, wearable robotics. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna, I'll stop sharing here, turn it over to Sasha and have a great day. See you all in spatial chat and, and throughout the day. Great, great, thanks, Greg. Um, I'm excited to get started. I just wanted to uh, remind the speakers that we're shooting for about 12 minutes talk or 12 to 15 and then another uh, eight to five minute talks of, uh, of que minutes of questions. Uh, for the audience, um, you can ask questions by raising your hand in Zoom or sending a question to chat and also ask questions through YouTube and we will be monitoring those. Um, and with that, I'm excited to get started and would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Amir Patel from the University of Cape Town who is here to talk to us about the function of the tail and the cheetah and whether or not real cheetahs use their tails like cheetah-like robots. Thank, thanks so much. Uh, let me just begin and share my screen. Okay, you guys see that okay? Yes, Ru yes, we can. yes, Ru yes we can. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Amir Patel. 
Uh, and today I'm going to be talking to you about some of the work uh, that we've been doing for a couple of years now to understand the cheetah. And you know, I'm coming from you, coming to you, sorry, very far away in, in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, and this is some work that I did with my PhD student, Stacey Shield. Um, so I always like to start my talk out just to show really the incredible um, ability to maneuver uh, that the cheetah has. So, uh, yeah, we, yeah, These modifications provide the cheetah with increased traction and fast, sharp turns. So, so really, really incredible motion there. And um, when I started my PhD, I really wanted to uh, understand that animal so that we could build much more agile uh, and autonomous robots. So. You know, when you talk about the cheetah, you have to talk about maneuverability and what, what, what is that, right? So acceleration, turning, braking, all of these things are critical to the survival of animals, right? So it's either you know, uh, the animal's hunting something or it is actually, you know, being hunted. Um, and uh, these are quite interesting from a biomechanics perspective because they have these competing requirements, right? So safety, economy, robustness, and then obviously, you know, being able to rapidly maneuver or agility. But interestingly, it's actually quite sparsely studied compared to, uh, you know, the steady state motions. You know, I think we already have a vocabulary for, for periodic motion, like things like gait, and we have models like the spring loaded inverted pendulum, but there's not actually much uh, being done on, on these uh, non-steady transient uh, maneuvers. And of course, they're going to be really important for us if we're ever going to take our robots out of the safe confines of the laboratory, right? Because the world is dynamic, it is unstructured, and our robots are going to have to react um, with, with, with high speed. Okay, so another thing to which, which I want to get across today is that maneuvers cause instability. And, and interestingly, when we look at the animal kingdom, uh, many of these maneuvers involve appendage stabilization. So, you know, things like uh, mantises, when they are uh, performing jumps, they actually flick up the abdomens and swing the arms. Uh, kangaroo rats, uh, I saw Yannicka speaking later, she's probably going to tell you a lot of this uh, about kangaroo rats, but they use details during, um, you know, evasion and jumping maneuvers. And then tarsiers, as an example, uh, you know, when they jump from tree to tree, they, they flick the tails. Um, there's, a, there's a whole host of, of examples, and we actually have an ICB review uh, coming out very soon, um, where we, we go through all of the, the different examples on how animals um, you know, negotiate this, this stability, maneuverability trade of um, using appendages. Uh, but one thing that's quite close to home and easy to understand is, you know, us, so bipeds. And anybody knows, you know, if, if you're running and you, you know, suddenly you're about to knock into some, somebody or anything like that, you're going you're gonna to use your arms, right? So um, in, in a rapid gait termination or rapid deceleration, we intuitively know that you know, some kind of arm motion is going to happen. And we, we, we explored that um, through trajectory optimization uh, by using this very simple 90 degree freedom model uh, with, with arms and without arms. And what we did was we started the model um, from various points within the a steady state um, gran and got it to terminate its gait uh, on, on varying frictions as well. So the results are not surprising. So you can see the model without the arms needs to take a couple of extra steps. And the one with the arms can stop in a much shorter distance by swinging its arms, you know, with a kind of Elvis maneuver at the end there, uh, which, which, which is sort of expected, right? But what was quite interesting for us from the results is that the arms really only gained real advantage in these, I guess, unfavorable conditions. So, you know, in, in a mid-stance condition, when we initiated the, the, the gate termination at, at a low friction, you know, the leg placement was enough to, you know, stop in, in, in a short distance. Whereas when you're in an unfavorable position or under high frictions, the arms really came into play. Right? So having arms to mitigate that instability really, really helped uh, the model. So, yeah. So today we're talking about cheetahs. Now. So uh, what, what do we know about the cheetah? So, if you ask anybody, any uh, game ranger in South Africa, or you watch any uh, any documentary on BBC, uh, you know you're going to hear things about the cheetah tail being considered high inertia. You're going to hear things about it's heavy. Um, people often say it's used as a rudder, 
stabilizer or counterweight often I've heard. Um, but interestingly, uh, as, I, as I discovered firsthand, uh, the cheetah tail is actually way more lightweight than, than one might expect. In fact, it's only about 2% um, of its body mass, you know, compare that to about 10% in, in some of the, um, the lizard, lizard tail work that the Bob Falls group has done. Um, but what's interesting is that there's quite a bit of aerodynamic effect. So once we uh, took the fur off the tail, we, we saw that it was actually quite skinny and the, most of the mass was concentrated down at the base. And however, the large amount of the volume was made up by the fur, which we then put in the wind tunnel and showed that it actually, you know, creates a non uh, insignificant amount of, of force, which could be used for stabilization. So another thing at the time of starting my work, my PhD, there was actually no biomechanic data on cheetahs. I was hoping to leverage off that to design some cool cheetah bio-inspired robot, but you know, nothing existed. However, uh, we got quite far in the, the, the cheetah-inspired robotic tail space. So I did quite a bit of work in my PhD on a robot called Dima. So it's a, a wheeled robot, um, which I'll show you in a bit. And by swinging the tail in the same way that the, the cheetah does, we are able to turn at much higher speeds than without the tail. And then similarly for rapid deceleration, we can swing the tail in the pitch axis. So that's where the other tail, you can see it just flips over. And then when we add the tail with a nice feedback controller, uh, we're able to stop at much higher. Redesign okay, the and then tail also, to be much lighter using aerodynamics, similar to the way that a parachute would move through the air. This makes yeah, it much lighter for the robot, um, but also- Yeah, Johnson's group has, has been doing some really cool stuff with cheetah-inspired aerodynamic tails, um, doing things like acceleration and also aerial writing. And then quite a while ago, uh, Soundbreak Yemu's group looked at disturbance rejection um, on the cheetah robot. And you can see, uh, uh, you know, hitting it with a wrecking ball um, and with the tail and a feedback controller, it's able, able to stabilize its starts quite nicely. So what we, what we know now is that it was quite well for bio-inspired robots, right? And uh, yeah, we, um, we, we've got several examples, but I've always had this lingering feeling and, and questions about what do real cheetahs do? And this has been a very difficult question to answer because GPS collars actually cannot provide the, the whole body kinematic data we need, you know, things like spines, uh, tail motion, leg motion, all of that information is lost when you just have a, a collar on an animal. So I, I sought to remedy this and, and developed an on animal motion capture system. And what we did was we, we designed a harness, a harness with uh, two cameras facing backwards and, and GPS and IMU. We did some kin kinematics and then an extended, extended common filter. And then we were able to reconstruct the, the motion quite accurately without any external cameras on the animal. So if you ever wanted to know what it looks like riding on the back of a cheetah, this is what it does. <laughs> Okay, so that works really well, but unfortunately, not all the cheetahs were comfortable with the system. Uh, and like all cats, they, they really didn't want to play along. So we had to rethink our, uh, our strategy. So we partnered with GoPro and uh, two um, cheetah breeding centers in South Africa. And we set up 12 uh, cameras in uh, the enclosures. And wh what they do every week with the cheetahs is they get them to chase a stimulus or lure um, for enrichment just to keep, the, uh, you know, keep them exercising. And they chased it around a track. And, and what we did was we observed uh, and, and placed the cameras in the parts where we, we you know, saw some interesting behavior happening. Um, but this was way harder than I thought uh, <laughs> when I had done this, you know, placing all these cameras down, because not all the cheetahs, most of them didn't have markers. So we had to develop a 3D marker post estimation system. And, and I partnered with some uh, really smart people uh, Alexander and McKinsey Mathis, and we ended up getting uh, a, a paper in Nature Protocols, um, extending deep lab cut the pose estimator to you know working 3D uh, in in an outdoor environment. So this is how this is how it works. Um, we take these raw videos from each view, so you can see Cheetah doing some cool stuff, and we then apply our 2D pose estimator. So we use the same 2D pose estimator for all these different views, by the way. Okay, and then once we have those six views, we can then do 3D reconstruction. So this is what it looks like. You can see the, 
a nice 3D skeletal model, similar to what you would get at, uh, you know, uh, on a Vicon, but, but outside of. <laughs> okay, so um, recently we just uh, released this entire uh, data set, you know, I think it's about three years worth of video footage, um, and we called it the Sino set, which is uh, uh, named after the, uh, the cheetah's Latin name. And it's, it consists of many uh, hand annotated frames, our three 3D reconstruction baseline methods. So if you guys are interested, you should check it out the, uh, in the bottom, on the bottom left, please download it. You know, I, I imagine people from computer vision and biomechanics or even reinforcement learning could check it out and, and, and find it useful. Um, okay, so yeah, now that we've finally got the data that we need, it was, as it was quite a challenge as I've, I've discussed, um, we can now start really investigating what's going on with the tail. And, and we've only recently done this, but I'm, I'm going to show you some stuff. So uh, we reconstruct instruct the motion from 20 points actually on the cheetah. So it looks like a model over there. But to make things a bit more tractable, we, uh, we sort of, uh, I guess, minimized it in terms of having a virtual body and a virtual tail described over there, um, where you can see the virtual tail is made up of center of mass um, of, the, of the, you know, the highly articulated tail. So some, some analysis that we've done already, and we've analyzed about 65 uh, reconstructed trajectories, and, and we specifically wanted to look at deceleration, you know, just again, uh, as a means to make things a bit easier. And we've seen that, you know, in the, in the robot case, it does make a difference to flick the tail up in the pitch axis. So we can see some things, you know, coming through the weak correlation, I guess, um, for, the, for the pitch angle deflection. So that's how much pitch angle, uh, is flicked by the tail versus the acceleration change. Um, but what is also interesting is that we also see some yaw deflection with the tail. So that's a bit more complicated than, than we would like. So the, the tail is also yawing during deceleration, which, which isn't as easy to analyze as possible. So we, we tried various permutations. I won't bore you with all of the, the details here, but nothing is really standing out just yet. So. In my lab, we really were big fans of trajectory optimization, particularly contact and implicit um, version. So we looked at a model with, with a tail and without the tail doing the same gate termination um, experiment we did with the bipeds. And surprisingly, we found that with a simple 2D model, we actually didn't see much of a difference with the tail. Even we, we even tried a super tail. So with something with torque way above, in fact, infinite torque. Um, and, and we still didn't see a real difference between what the uh, you know, the tailed versus the no tailed version could do. And here's some, here's some examples of that trajectory. You can see not really much of a difference. Okay, and to, to dig down, let's look at the typical deceleration. So straight line deceleration, uh, the cheetah's, uh, you know, coming towards the lure and it flicks the tail up. So you can see flicking the tail up, sort of straight in the pitch axis, exactly what we saw in, uh, what we did with Dima. Um, so looking at that from the reconstruction, we can see, you know, some nice, nice, very clear pitch axis flick. But interestingly, when we look at it from the front view, it's a bit more complicated than that. So we can see a bit of rolling of the body, the back torso, and we can also see a bit of yawing in the tail. So it's a bit more complicated than we would like. Um, so, I guess for, for discussion in which I would like to hear back from, from people, some opinions is that this is not entirely as simple as we think, right? So the, the ideas that, you know, the similar ways in which uh, tails weren't analyzed in lizards, I don't think we're gonna be able to do that. Um, and the tail isn't being used simply as a pitch stabilizer. Um, so in future work, we definitely wanna look at some faster animals. So it's been shown that these, uh, you know, these captive fed cheetahs, we only, they only get you know, maximum we've got is about 20 meters per second. And in the wild, they can go up to 29 meters per second. They're also quite docile because they're all gonna be fed. Um, so we wanna look at getting some wild animal footage here in South Africa uh, and develop a, a wild um, animal 3D reconstruction system. And another, another thing we wanna investigate is that possibly the tail isn't just being, isn't being used for gross uh, pitch control, but possibly maybe for body shape control. So, one, one idea I'd like to discuss is that the hind legs of the cheetah are mainly designed for propulsion. So they're designed to really push back. And what, what I think the tail is, is, is doing there is it's just putting the, the hind legs in a more favorable position. So whether it's turning or whether it's decelerating, 
it's going to flick the tail uh, in a manner to do that. So uh, thank you for your time. These are the references. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to some questions. All right, thank you. Uh, just a reminder again, just please read, read, read your, your questions. Do you need to stop sharing? I'm sorry? Do I need to stop sharing? Yeah, you can stop uh, sharing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. All right, well, we do have one question uh, from Nidhi cool. Siddhapathy. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about how you calibrated all the cameras uh, for the cheetah capture? Sure, uh, they sure. So they a pretty large area may not all be capturing the same space. Yeah, no, it's a huge area. So it's, uh, I mean, if, if you check out the paper and it's up on archive, um, it's, it's about six meters by 12 meters. Uh, and, and we had, so we had three, um, three GoPros on each side and we had to, we had to use a massive checkerboard. <laughs> So there's a couple of videos up uh, where you can see on the data set where one of my unfortunate grad students is, is moving it around and, you know, moving it through the volume. But yeah, so it's calibrated. Um, I don't know the, uh, the stats offhand, but uh, it's, it's calibrated quite well. Basically, what we did was we cal calibrated a, a stereo pair. So we calibrated one and two, and then we calibrated two and three, and then we did three and four and so on around the chain. And then we did a sparse bundle adjustment um, to do, you know, calibrate all of them simultaneously. And that gave us a really, really nice calibration. So all of that information, all of the calibration, time synchronization, the 2D law, uh, labels, um, and the raw videos are all up on the data set. So if you guys are keen, you should, you should definitely check it out. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, Aaron, Aaron Johnson? Hey, I know that guy. <laughs> Hey there. Uh, well, since we just wrote this paper on using cheetah tails to accelerate and decelerate, I'm guided to hear that you don't think that's really it. So I, I'm thinking back, and it's a shame Joe's not here today, but we mm. were actually looking at uh, the demonstration we did on the robot was acceleration, because that's much easier to do. You can start at zero. <laughs> um, mm. And so I think everything that we, we looked at was sort of, you know, trying to, trying to get up to speed quickly. So in those yeah. sort of comparison plots that you had there, um, you were looking at, at deceleration. Have you looked at, have you done that same experiment with acceleration? I would love to do that experiment, but the cheetahs never, they never bolt <laughs> straight from the start. So they always, they need to be coaxed and then they kind of gently start running. But once they start model, running- Just in your model. Yeah. Oh, in the model, uh, yeah, uh, we, we, we haven't actually yet. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great idea and definitely something I'll tell Stacy to do. Yeah, and Joe's Joe's out this week, but I, I'll, I will ask him if when we did that for the robot, if if he if he tried deceleration, or mm. if we didn't bother because we knew it would be easier to to run the experiment with deceleration. Yeah, look, I mean, I'm not saying that it's not it's not useful pitch stabilization. I'm saying that it's not as clear cut as as we think, as it's just you know moving in the pitch axis. I think it's a much more complicated motion. What I didn't show is that often, um, you know, once it once it reached the end of the stroke, sort of of the tail. It would make this kind of circular motion, conical motion uh, um, we talk about. So it's, yeah, it's, and it's also very, very much dependent on when in the stride it's initiated. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what we're going to look at the next step is um, I want to, I want to investigate if I could just do a much simpler model. I think that will tell us a lot about, but with a, a bendable kind of spine, because I think that the spine bending has a lot to uh, tell us the, that's certainly a big part of their running strategy. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, good to see you. All right, cool. Man. Thanks. Uh, we have time for one one more question um, for, from the chat. If the tail is using aerodynamic forces, would experiments in high wind conditions reveal the utility? And I'm actually going to tack on a part two to that question of what does that mean for robotic tails? Do they need to be now shifted a little bit toward you know the center of mass towards towards the body and fuzzy? <laughs> Well, yeah, okay, yeah. So, so in terms of the, you know, how it would affect the motion. So, the, obviously, the faster the, that it moves, it goes up quadratically, right? So, so that's why the, the cheetah can really leverage this. Um, and we, and I think in our simulations, we calculated up to forty percent extra angular impulse you get when it's running uh, at its top speed. Um, so, yeah, the the same part of that is that so so that the paper that I showed with Erin. Um, I, we demonstrated that with a really lightweight tail, we could get the same sort of performance that you could with a heavy, heavy mass, mass inertia kind of tail. So that's great for 
from the robotics perspective because it means you don't have to carry around this heavy mass, which you know costs you battery time and, and mission time. Um, so yeah, it is quite cool, but it doesn't have to be furry. It can, it's a bi-inspired tail, right? So, so the one we did on Minotaur was actually a sail, which is actually has much more drag than the fur. Mm -hmm. but yeah, that, make, that makes sense. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, there are a lot more other good questions. Hopefully you can discuss them in the spatial chat later on. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Chen Li from Johns Hopkins University, who will talk to us about multi-legged robot locomotion and transitions in complex 3D terrain. All right, Chen, we, uh, we see your slides perfectly. I think we're ready to go. Oh, sorry, I forgot to unmute. So th thank you to uh, the organizers for uh, inviting and giving me the opportunity to present our work. So I'm going to give an overview of uh, part of our work in over the last few years on multi-legged locomotive transitions. Um, this, uh, if you're interested, we have a review paper that's just published a couple of weeks ago. Um, so you can learn more. And before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge my three PhD students, Ratan, Chihan, and Yaqing, uh, who have contributed to this review. So robots are on the verge of becoming a major part of society. And we have already seen a lot of mobile robots being developed over the past few decades. And some of them are already moving really well in the real world, most notably self-driving cars and uh, Martian rovers. And when we look at how robots solve the problem of locomotion in complex environment, it very often relies on using a geometric map to avoid obstacles. You scan your environment and then classify anything that's other than the flat ground here in this case. And then you can plan transitions between uh, different driving modes to avoid obstacles. But there are many applications where we need robots to not just avoid obstacles, but actually traverse them, such as uh, going through earthquake rubble a forest floor or marching rocks for things like search and rescue, environmental monitoring, and extraterrestrial exploration. And the reality is that our robots are still not doing quite well in these kinds of environments. And this is largely because we don't have a good understanding of the physical interaction with complex terrain. Animals, by contrast, they can move exceedingly well in pretty much any type of terrain, uh, making robust locomotive transitions. So when we look at our knowledge of uh, terrestrial locomotion in both animals and robots, we can see that uh, the majority of our focus has been on understanding how to generate and stabilize steady state locomotion uh, on relatively simple flat ground or with a modest perturbations from relatively small obstacles compared to, to the fewer size. But when it comes to something more complex like this, it is not clear that this limit cycle uh, description uh, really will, works well. And even more so, we still lack conceptual framework to think about locomotive transitions. So I became interested in this problem when I was a postdoc working with Bob Fo at UC Berkeley. And at the time I uh, looked into how uh, animals and robots can traverse a terrain such as a forest floor. And you can see this just appears formidable there. It is very heterogeneous with many different kinds of obstacles. So over there, what I did was a first step to uh, look at dense vegetation and I picked grass as a, a starting point, cr uh, created grass-like beams that can be controlled and varied, uh, much like you can use wind tunnel to, to do repeatable experiments for flight. Uh, with this, uh, we, can then dis we then discovered that these cockroaches uh, native to forest, they can uh, make this multi-pathway transitions in a prob probabilistic manner across different modes to traverse. Uh, so this got me very interested in this direction. And over the last few years in my lab, we have uh, built upon this initial insight and abstracted different challenges from different kinds of complex 3D terrain and study them uh, systematically using an experimental physics approach to try to understand the principles. And our hope is that if we can understand how animals and how robots should uh, interact with these uh, different distinct challenges to make transitions, we can hopefully eventually somehow piece them together. Uh, so that, yeah, so we, towards this goal, we have been developing laboratory uh, controlled model terrain 
uh, this as an example with beams that with which we can control its stiffness as well as geometry. Uh, and we also develop techniques to measure accurately the locomotor terrain interaction and the uh, probabilistic transitions with large sample size. And this measuring of the 3D kinematics might not be, uh, it's actually not trivial because uh, they have very large body rotation and very often occlusions. With these techniques, we then perform systematic experiments using both animals as well as simple robots as physical models. To, uh, to not only test hypotheses from the animal, but more importantly, to uh, study uh, the behavior of the system in the locomotor and terrain parameter space well beyond that, what's found in the animal to discover principles. And finally, we can then create a variety of uh, physics models to describe the locomotor terrain interaction and understand how locomotor transitions emerge. Uh, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to mainly focus on this potential energy landscape approach, which turned out to be uh, quite useful for a variety of model systems. But before I uh, explain these, I just want to make a point that we have taken this approach, which has been proven very useful for studying, uh, studying complex fluid structure interaction in fluids, uh, which is that we first try to figure out, the phys understand physical interaction uh, with which we can then have a foundation to further study neuromechanical feedback control. So with this in mind, we focus uh, as a first step on studying the animals in their escape behavior, which is bandwidth limited and more, more towards feed forward driven. We also use uh, robots that are feed forward controlled uh, to begin with. So in the next few minutes, I will go through one particular model system to illustrate how we can integrate these uh, different uh, approaches to to understand locomotive transitions. So here is a, this model system is uh, traversing uh, grass-like beams that can bend and particularly looking at a transition from what we call a pitch to a roll mode. So here's what the pitch mode looks like. It really is the animal pushing down the beams in which its body has to pitch up uh, because of the restoring torque. And here's the animal initially trying to push through, but well before it proceeds, it quickly makes a transition to rolling its body to go through the gaps in the middle. Now, if you think about the physical interaction, the simplest model you can think of is this uh, uh, very simple model which, uh, in, in which we ignore the, the dynamics completely and approx approximate the animal as a rigid body that can translate and rotate. Uh, and then these beams are placed with torsional springs and they can bend due to the interaction of the body. So now you can write down the total potential energy of the system, which will then depend on the position and orientation of this body. And here's a snapshot of the potential energy landscape over the body pitch and roll degrees of freedom uh, when the body is close to the beams. You can see that three uh, local minima basins have emerged. In the middle here, you have a, a basin with zero roll and a finite pitch. Uh, corresponding to this state if you fall to the minima of that basin. And this is reminiscent of the pitch mode. And here you have two other basins which uh, are lower. And if you fall to the minima of the, those basins, you would either roll to the left or to the right. So what appears to be happening uh, when the animal makes this pitch to roll transition is that it escapes from a pitch basin to find a roll basin uh, during which you have to overcome these potential energy barriers. Uh, so this suggests that perhaps we can use this potential energy landscape to understand locomotive transition as a destabilizing barrier crossing transition. And we had a very interesting hypothesis, which is when you look at the animal uh, interacting with these beams, you can see that due to their uh, oscillatory self-propulsion, their body oscillates substantially. So perhaps the kin kinetic energy from that can help you overcome these potential energy barrier to make the transition. So to, to understand this systematically, we develop a robotic physical model, which is basically a physical realization of our simple physics model. Uh, and then we can drive the robot forward as well as oscillate it uh, with different frequencies to change the kinetic energy to test this hypothesis. So here are representative videos without any oscillation and with high oscillation. And you can see without the system is stuck in the middle uh, using this pitch mode to push down the beams and traverse. And with oscillation, it uh, very quickly escapes from that mode and makes this transition to the roll mode. And when we 
uh, visualize the measured system state trajectory, uh, the evolution of the system state on the reconstructed potential energy landscape, you can clearly see that when you're stuck in the pitch basin, it, sorry, when you're st stuck in the pitch mode, you are indeed trapped in this pitch basin. And when you are able to make a transition, you very quickly find your way out of that basin to reach the roll basin by crossing the barrier. And further quantify uh, or measure the potential energy barrier that's required to make this transition, which changes as the uh, system moves forward, because this landscape depends not only on the body pitch and roll, but also the forward position. And that's shown by this black curve here. And this uh, green line is the uh, average kinetic energy uh, due to this oscillation. And as we expect for these feed forward driven robots, uh, it indeed makes this transition exactly when the kinetic energy is exceeding the potential energy barrier. So we did similar experiments and modeling analysis for our animals and confirmed that they, in, they also, their transition from the pitch to the roll mode is also this barrier crossing transition. Uh, but what's different is that for the animal, uh, it can actually make transition well before this uh, potential energy barrier has dropped below the kinetic energy fluctuation. And this suggests that the animal must be also be using some kind of active adjustment, not just simply oscillating uh, in a feed forward way like a robot. So we're, we have just begun studying this in a follow up project, measuring the detailed kinematics of the animal. And we found several interesting adjustments, uh, which very likely involve sensory uh, feedback. And we are uh, also beginning to study this using a robotic physical model which has the ability to make these similar adjustments, but also to control its adjustment using four sensors through feedback control. Um, and we're hoping to not only test the hypothesis in the animal, but also use the robot to uh, explore the parameter space and understand how to use physical interaction intelligently. So I have elaborated how we do these using a particular model system. We have actually explored several other systems initially without really expecting uh, general patterns to emerge. But when we look back after several years of work, we found that uh, the very stereotyped modes that we observe in both animals and robots uh, interacting with the environment in these systems turn out to emerge from the system being attracted to these distinct basins. And then the transitions are barrier crossing uh, transitions on the potential energy landscape. And finally, using this uh, landscape uh, approach, we can understand uh, a variety of empirically discovered strategies to enhance or, or sometimes reduce undesir undesirable transition to be uh, either one of three things. You can steer your system on the landscape, you can change the landscape barrier, and you can also add or remove landscape basins. Uh, so our uh, next step uh, is we would like to begin to see how we can put these uh, distinct challenges together to understand how multi-pathway transitions emerge in, uh, in a heterogeneous 3D uh, terrain. Uh, so this would be analogous to how people have used free energy landscape to understand and eventually predict multi-pathway protein folding transitions, except that here our system is not only dri driven by physics, there is this intelligence aspect. And it, more broadly, we're hoping that our potential energy uh, landscape can be combined with other kinds of landscape that researchers have uh, developed in various fields, which describe different uh, or other important driving factors of animal and robot movement, and eventually piece these together to allow robots to make robust locomotive transitions uh, akin to what they have been doing, being able to do with obstacle avoidance but to really enable them to go to places that they cannot yet do. Uh, so uh, finally, I just wanna uh, make a few points that I think our studies have suggested, uh, which uh, hopefully can, uh, the, the field can, can uh, think about. So first, multi-legged systems can have these very rich locomotive transitions. Uh, and for them, the stereotype locomotive modes are strongly constrained by physical interaction. Uh, in these systems, the stochasticity and variability are, can be very useful for transitions and destabilizing yourself is necessary for transitions. Also, uh, a particular type of rough terrain can mean very different things for different systems of different uh, sizes. 
And finally, we need to understand uh, the locomotive terrain interaction physics or aerodynamics to better understand and advance animal and robot locomotion in a realistic environment. So with that, I would like to thank my lab members, uh, many colleagues who have uh, discussed over the years with us and our funding sources. And I will uh, thank, thank you all for your attention and I will take questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, any questions? Thank you for a great talk. Thank you. All right, well, I, I have a question about, um, you know, if anybody wants to jump in, but I have a question. So you mentioned that some animals, uh, well, sometimes the animals choose to kind of go forward and sometimes they vibrate and, 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 and pitch and roll. Is there anything, indicators from the environment um, of what the animal will do? Is, there, is it dependent on the environment or is it, you know, how does the animal decide which movement to choose? Yes, uh, so, so, so when we, I think this, um, yeah, this also, I, I kind of indicated this a bit that when you study, uh, when we study the fit forward driven robot, then their motion basically emerges just from that physical interaction. That there's no intelligence. But when we look at the animal, it, in, it very often displays qualitatively similar uh, patterns. But when you look at the, the problem, for example, the probability of those transitions is substantially different from the robot. And we think that this is just as that example that I showed for traveling the beams indicates that the animals can very likely through their sensory feedback to gather some information of the environment and do things to to kind of to facilitate the transition towards the, the mode that is desirable for, for their high level task. So here, for example, they want to traverse the obstacles and and they can, they, uh, let me show, show the slides. Yeah, so here we found that the, when you look at the animal, we found that they would, uh, right before and, and during their road transition, they would tuck their hind legs inward, which seems to be reducing their stability in rolling to facilitate that roll transition. And they would use the, the left and the right hind legs differentially to again probably generate a torque to facilitate that. Uh, what we don't understand very well yet is they have this very high frequency oscillation of their head and abdomen uh, before and during this transition. We think that it is likely sensing the terrain using the head and reducing the, the, the friction when they're kind of sandwiched in between these beams. So they can make these uh, different adjustments and in uh, this is a more recent study in which we studied this carefully in one particular beam setup. But in our earlier study, when we first explored these, uh, like in this study, we actually have varied the beam stiffness kind of uh, as a proxy to study what if the animal encounters something from very flimsy grass to some very stiff, uh, say, bushes. Are they going to? To change their behavior, and we, we do see that their probability of transition from one mode to another changes significantly, which can uh, be partly be substantially exp explained by just the passive physics, but not entirely. So that again uh, speaks to the fact that animals can can, as we expect, do much better uh, with some kind of intelligent sensing and control, and that's something we also should. Uh, by understanding the physical principles should apply to the robots. Right. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. Uh, Chris. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee, a very interesting talk. I, I was really curious because when, when you presented the, this idea of uh, thinking about, you know, uh, this potential energy landscape, mm -hmm. you got me thinking about, uh, it, it looks like you're, you're looking at a landscape at a particular kinetic energy or, or speed. And I'm wondering how that how that potential energy landscape might change across different speeds. Do you, uh, if you were to kind of graph this multi-dimensional space, you know, state space, how would that look? Yes, yes. So, yeah. So, so that kind of I guess gets at a, a, a kind of one limitation of our model, which we are really hoping to to kind of improve on uh, in the next step. So, so as as you had indicated, so this potential energy landscape really is is a very high-dimensional landscape. It depends on 
uh, not just the, the position, sorry, the orientation that I have shown here, but also the position of this. this uh, yeah, so, so when you move at different speeds, that uh, kind of the, the way I showed it, it, you can see that the lens, this landscape over the body pitch and roll space evolves as you move forward. So depending on different speeds of yourself moving forward, it's going to evolve at different rates. And uh, so one kind of initial step we have taken towards that is, this is still very preliminary and um, let me show one slide here. So, so here, this is uh, uh, our first attempt to see how, if we can actually understand the, and even predict the dynamics here. So what we're doing is basically applying Newton's second law. We have the system that if this is the acceleration, uh, which includes both, trans it can include both translation and rotation. And then you have a potential energy landscape whose gradient gives you the conservative forces and you might have some other non-conservative forces here where just make up a, an example of a viscous like drag. And then you might have, you, you will very likely have a random force. And with this, we can then simulate the, the, the dynamic kind of evolution of the system state. And you can see it oops, uh, this is not sure. on the left here, this is experimental measurement. So, so, you, can, oops, yeah, so you can see that they, they don't, they certainly don't match because uh, we just made up this model, but you do see this qualitatively similar behavior. And, but as you will expect, when you, when you kind of tune your system, uh, the, the parameters that affect the dynamics, such as velocity, this, all of these is going to change. So, so, uh, so I don't have a good answer, like what's the right way to do this? We're just beginning to think about this. No, 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 it's a very, very interesting way of thinking about things. Yeah, yeah thank you. All right, thank you very much for, for that great talk. Uh, let's move on to our last speaker for this morning session. I'd like to introduce Dr. Tomaso Lenzi from the University of Utah. And he will talk to us about engineering next generation robotic blood prosthetics, please. Okay, can you see the slide and hear me okay? We look great. All right, so well, thanks for the introduction. Um, so robotic leg prosthesis really promised to revolutionize the field and, and improve the quality of life of millions of people. And, and, you know, the basic idea is that if you have sensors, actuators, and control, then you can closely replicate the biomechanical function of the missing biological leg and that, and by doing that, improve mobility. But um, the problem is that um, these additional components end up uh, making your prosthesis much heavier. And so, you know, twice, sometimes three times um, as heavy as a conventional plastic prosthesis. And so while there's no doubt that replicating the biomechanical function of the missing leg is super important, we also know that increasing the prosthesis mass has some negative effects, including metabolic cost of walking, the, the gait symmetry, uh, the muscle effort and joint effort, and most importantly, it has a really negative impact on the socket, which is a quite a critical component on a prosthesis. And so uh, the bottom line is that despite many years under development, power prosthesis have yet to really achieve success from a clinical standpoint. And passive microprocessor control prosthesis still are the best solution for someone with an above knee amputation. And so over uh, the last few years, um, really been focusing on trying to answer this question, which is, can we build a lightweight, compact and efficient robotic like prosthesis? So in other terms, can we find a way to keep all the positive things that actuators, sensors, and control can bring to the table without having the negative effects of the added prosthesis weight? And so really in this brief talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit of what I've uh, learned trying to address this question and focus on the most recent work um, um, on our robotic leg prosthesis. And so, so when you look at design, you know, I think the most important lesson that I feel like sharing is that um, it's not really about uh, finding a super motor, a super battery, or the super duper spring. It's not really about the single component. It's really more about looking at how these components interact dynamically and about taking into account from the get-go the, 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 the biomechanical requirements, the biomechanical function, but also the controls. It is really hard for me to think about design separate from control. And I think that really is very important. And so, so if you look at any biomechanics, um, and 
unfortunately your song is not showing well, but um, if you look at any biomechanics, the problem that you have is that, um, you know, there's a really wide ranges of torque and speed that you have to be able to replicate uh, with your prosthesis. And unfortunately, um, when you look at the function of DC motors, it doesn't really matter what kind of DC motor you use, uh, you don't really have that uh, luxury. You know, your motor really only works well for a very narrow range of torques and speed. And outside of this range of torques and speed, then uh, both mechanical power output and efficiency decrease dramatically, okay? And, and so that's a problem because then you end up using a motor in a very, very inefficient way, which means you need a much bigger motor to satisfy the same upper requirements, but also you need, uh, but also you need, um, you know, a bigger battery to, to, to try and address that, um, their requirements, which end up really causing a problem. And so um, hopefully slides are not okay. Um, let me solve some issues here. Let me try stop sharing for a second. I'm sorry about that. Let me go back. Fortunately, box drive decided to crash on me. <laughs> oh, let me see if I can restore this. Okay, it's connected to the box. Sorry for inconvenience. Okay, box drive looks white now. So let's try. See if I get green light again. Do -do -do. These are the realities we've come to expect from the uh, from the pandemic era. So I, to, so I don't know. I just think. Um, Box and I don't really have a good relationship. You know, I can tell you stories about that, but um, these kind of odds. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's see if I'm back to normal. Okay. Yes, I see something. Okay. All right. Sharing. Let's go back to that. Where was I? About here. Okay. You didn't see this light. I guess I talk about it a little bit, and you can still see it right now. All good. Yeah. Okay. Again, sorry about it. Okay. So, so again, the point was like you get a really wide range of torque to speed. You want to collapse them and decrease them so they can make use a smaller monster, small battery. And so really, you know, the device that we developed, this latest generation of our bionic knee, really revolves around this new transmission concept. And, and the idea is that we want to try and combine the benefits of elastic actuation, like serious elastic or parallel elastic actuation, with that of a variable transmission. And so for those of you that are more into design and kinematics, this is a five-bar mechanism with two degrees of freedom. And one of the joints is possibly actuated by a small coil spring, and the other joint is actuated by a linear actuator, pretty much it's a DC motor and ball screw combination. But what's really unique about this design is that these two joints really interact with each other dynamically. So when the main transmission system, the linear transmission pulls to provide extension torque with the knee, then the spring deflects, and by deflecting, it really increases the moment arm of the linear actuator with respect to the knee joint. And what happens as a consequence is that you increase the torque ratio, okay? And so, um, and so by doing that, uh, you really now have a very dynamic transmission system that continuously and possibly react to the output uh, on the external output, to the load that is providing, pretty much increasing possibly and continuously the transmission ratio or the torque ratio, I should say, uh, whenever there is need for higher extension torque. And so, you know, you may think maybe this is similar to serious elastic actuator, and to some extent it is, but really this benchtop testing on, on the torque control shows that there are quite a big difference, you know. You see, when you provide torque and extension, what happens is that your transmission ratio increases. And because you're increasing your transmission ratio, then for the same output torque, you need lower amount of motor torque and lower current. 
And because you need then lower current or lower torque, then you can pick a smaller motor and a smaller battery without sacrificing output torque. And, um, and so that's really a way that uh, can enable you to make a smaller ladder prosthesis. But also this has an effect on the dynamics of the leg, specifically on the passive properties of your leg, right? Because now you have a smaller motor, you have a relatively low transmission ratio during walking. Um, and so what happens is the output joint is actually very small, actually the smallest in the field. And because you are using a linear transmission system as a high efficiency, uh, we see here from batch stop testing about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 Newton meters so of back driving force, then really you have something that as you can see in this video here, this swing completely possibly. And that's really cool because now it really simplifies the control problem. But then the other thing that you do is that you're constantly slowing down your knee while you're walking, which means you have an opportunity to regenerate energy, which helps keeping the weight of the device low. And so, <clears throat> so increasing the transmission ratio helps, passive dynamics helps, but there's another thing um, that is a, a little bit unique about this device, which is the transmission system has been designed so that um, the motor is in a fixed position with respect to the frame. The frame wraps around the motor and pretty much works as a heat sink. It's a pretty big heat sink, right? And so, as a result of that, you can take a DC motor that nominally, like alone outside of the frame, could only provide you 120 watts continuously, and then you can operate that at 280 watts continuously without overheating the motor, which is great because it's a small motor. This is just an 150 grams Maxon motors, right? And then, if your short term operation is like 10 minutes, right? you're running, you're jogging doing something, or need to really climb, so it's really hard, you can actually operate for 10 minutes under 460 watts continuously without overeating. And so, and so a result, um, you know, we can be able really to package all of these in something is about 1.5 kilogram, uh, which is the same weight of a microprocessor control prosthesis. This is a picture of the Autobox C leg, which is the best selling uh, knee prosthesis on the market, but also able to replicate, you know, the proportions and, and the size of the device, which is usually important if you want to use this outside of the lab. So, so what about um, ankles? Um, so, you know, ankles you see here, typically if you were to have an amputation below uh, the knee, you will use something that looks like the device on the left, which is pretty much just a carbon fiber spring, okay? There's no articulation, there's no ankle at all. And, and, uh, and really no virtually all power prosthesis really are designed to stuck uh, a, a, a powered uh, device or a power system on top of this foot that was originally designed to work without any articulation. And, and this is not necessarily a bad approach. You know, you can really do a good job with this power ankle to replicate the biomechanics of the biological ankle, but you still are missing the function of the foot. Okay. And, and now I'm not an expert in foot mechanics. Hopefully Dr. Takashi will tell you everything about it in the next session, but but the toe is actually really important. It's important for gait. It's even more important for functional mobility. And what's very interesting to me is that when you look at the biomechanics of the foot, uh, the toe has kind of an opposite function with respect to the ankle, right? So the ankle is really positive power, net positive energy, at least at sustained walking speed. The toe instead is primarily dissipating, okay? And, and it's a negative power. And that's a great opportunity as a designer, right? And so our prototype of the bionic foot really wanted to replicate this function. So we do have an articulated ankle and an articulated toe. Uh, but what's really unique about this design is that we have an underactuated mechanism that connects the toe and the ankle. And, so, and so, so the reason why that's cool is that instead of dissipating the energy, which you don't want to do in a prosthesis, because that means like you're, you're wasting your energy, you actually are transferring the energy from the toe to the ankle, which means then you lower the requirements in terms of power for your actuators, your DC motor, and you're also lowering the requirements in terms of speed. Um, and because of course you are regenerating energy or storing energy instead of using that energy, dissipating that, then you, you have an opportunity to select a smaller ankle. And, um, and so, so hopefully with this new device, which is about 1.5 kilograms, including battery, control, electronics, covers, sensors, everything, uh, we can replicate the ankle joint and also the toe joint and try to take a look at what kind of effect we can have, what kind of benefits we can have out of that toe. And then combine the knee and the ankle together, um, we have a device which is about three kilogram, which is significantly lower than pretty much any power uh, device with comparable uh, torque and power. Um, it's the same weight of microprocessor control prosthesis. 
Um, but you know what's even more um, exciting to me is that really these new devices being designed to satisfy ISO standards. All well, the, the components are designed as sort of standard and selected and designed. The electronics is fully embedded and, and containing to the device. And, um, and so we just started a new project where we will send this device home for a month or so uh, with um, individuals with above knee amputations to, to see how they use it in the real world. And so really, you know, um, thinking about these goal, kind of long-term goal of sending the device home and emulating the real world, uh, we developed a controller really um, aiming for that. And so, and really here, we try to approach the problem from a little bit of a different perspective. Instead of, you know, so the most common approach for control of a power prestige is pretty much that of developing a ton of different controllers, like one for walking, one for running, one for stairs, one for ramp, one for sit to stand, uh, you know, you kind of get it, right? And then when you combine all of this together in online, then you have a classifier that pretty much, pretty much is trying to guess online what activity the user wants to do, and then you switch between different controllers. And, and this has been pretty successful as an approach, but you know, it's actually very hard to always guess what the user wants to do and get it right 100% of the time, because there's a huge variability in the real world environment and how people walk. And so really what we're trying to do instead is to develop controllers that continuously adapt to the user and to the environment. And, and it can take into account the volition of the user into, in, while doing that so that if they, these same controls can truly adapt, then we don't really have to use different controllers. We don't have to classify what kind of activities. We can always run the same ones. But so, so let me give an example of this. You know, uh, for example, in this video, you see there's this one of our subject participants walking over ground and then crossing over obstacle. Now, what's unique about this video is that as far as the controller is concerned, as far as the prosthesis is concerned, there is no obstacle whatsoever. What we do is not trying to detect if there's an obstacle and switch. What we do really is giving the user indirect but volitional control over foot clearance by continuously adapting the trajectory of the prosthesis to the movement of the residual limb so that they're free to change the foot clearance and crossover obstacles without having to detect that. And then more recently, we've extended this approach to ambulational stairs. And so again, kind of same idea. In this video, you see subject is coming one step at a time and two steps at a time. But again, as far as the controller is concerned, there isn't even a step. There isn't a one-step controller or a two-step controller, which is continuously adapt to what the user is doing and what the interaction with the environment is, which we can detect the onboard sensors. And, and, and also, you know, um, we, we also really feel that giving volitional control to the user is an essential part of mobility, giving the feel that they can change what the prosthesis does based on, on their uh, volition, it's usually important. And so, so we're really focusing now on developing neural controllers here. And in, in, in this first um, ex in the experiment you see here, what we're doing is that we're using uh, one single EMG sensor, which is placed inside the socket and on the back of the thigh. And what we're giving the user is direct control of the torque that is provided by the knee, which he can change as he squat and sit down or sit down and stand up um, and also to perform other activities like um, lounging, for example. And so when you put everything together, this is video actually took two days ago, that's what it looks like. Um, and, um, and so this is again, one expert subject kind of ambulating with a leg in love. And, and, and you know, as you watch this video, what I really love about it is that everything is running on the prosthesis. There's no external system that we're using. And also more important, there's no switching between different controllers. There's no stairs or walking controller. There's no obstacle and not obstacle controller. We're really just using pretty much two control system. One, whenever the foot is in contact with the ground and another one, whenever the foot is off the ground, which we detect using our embedded sensor. And so, I'm not sure what you're doing in time, but I really want to show you the last couple of videos of something. And just, you know, one, one or two more minutes. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, so again, when we look at that goal of long-term ambulation for the first time, I've been able to have two prototypes of the same leg. And so we're start, start to look at other kind of um, population here. Uh, we're looking at bilateral, for example, which we feel is a population that can greatly benefit about uh, power prosthetics because they don't have 
in the sound side uh, that can compensate uh, for a positive prosthesis. And so it was able to walk pretty good and, and ambulate on stairs with a little bit of help from us um, in a single session. And so, and then more recently, um, because the new ankle has embedded batteries, control and, and electronic solving together, then we we're able also to start understanding what the needs are for individuals with uh, below knee amputations. And here's a person running and, and walking on a, on a treadmill. So, um, so in conclusion, um, I, I think what we're showing is that uh, developing lightweight, compact and efficient prosthesis is possible and really is about optimizing all this interaction with all these components. And certainly replicating the key biomechanical functions of the biological leg is important, but we can't just copy the morphology of the human leg, right? Um, we really need to find designs that can leverage the strengths of artificial technologies. Control is also a very important thing that we need to consider in design. And in my experience, if you get the passive dynamics right, then solving the control problem makes it a lot easier. Uh, and, and again, I don't believe that control accuracy and bandwidth are that important for robotic prosthesis. Human legs are rather inaccurate and are really not high bandwidth, really. And so, and then finally, um, I think if you really want to be serious about building a prosthesis, there are so many other additional constraints to be taken into account. And I feel like if we don't take these constraints into account, then it's really hard to have something that can really make it out of the lab. And, and so I feel like it's important to take these constraints into account early on in design phase and being pretty deliberate about um, just abandoning solutions that stand no chance to satisfy those extra requirements, even if they look really cool on paper and really, really nice. Okay, so- um, All right, thank yeah, you. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience. Hopefully we could still have a good discussion. Right, we, I wish it was in person, but I'm looking okay, forward great, to talking. Great talk, about. thank you very much. And we have a lot of questions and we have time for, for a couple. Um, one of the questions is, have you done many tests of the ankle in isolation and how, do they, how does it compare to other uh, active microcontrolled prostheses? And then there's a part two, and several people have asked, is there any series elasticity for shock absorption? And how do you think that would affect the device? Would it potentially assist if there's um, elastic tissue elements that kind of interact with the motors? Yeah, so um, those are great questions. So the first one, I'm not sure what it means like is isolation, if it means like bench top testing or, or below knee. Uh, but in terms of like torque and power is pretty comparable to any other device. So compared to the, OS, the Empower, which is um, provided by Autobook, we are about twice the range of motion, which is about 40 degrees and same torque and power. Um, and um, so that, that's kind of about the fir first question. And then for the second question, soft tissue is such an important question. So some of the controllers that we do, like shock absorption is very important, but um, it's, it's um, the socket interface is actually a very compliant interface per se. And so sometimes, uh, for example, we see this problem trying to replicate stance knee flexion, like stance of the knee, knee flexion early stance, uh, they can kind of conflict with each other and people typically don't like it that much when there's some extra absorption or flexion either coming from the joint or other system because they tend to fear that the system may collapse underneath. It doesn't, they rather prefer something that is rather firm as they walk. Great, Th thank you. Uh, another question from YouTube. Uh, do you consider enabling movement in different planes rather than solely the sagittal plane? And if so, in which one? Yeah, that's another great question. I, we don't really have an immediate plan for that. And the reason for that is that, um, again, shoes and the compliance in the socket already can do a lot. And it's not great, don't get me wrong, but the problem that you have in prosthetics is there's always like a trade-off between what you're adding in terms of function and what you get in terms of complexity and, and, and weight as well. And so we don't have an immediate plan but I do believe that two degree of freedom ankle movement in the frontal plane could be really beneficial for people who want to uh, do more with their prosthesis, especially like rough terrains. Uh, and I guess we have time for maybe one more question. 
Uh, do you know how, do you have any insights on how the center of pressure behaves on the prosthetic side? Yeah, yeah. So we have a so we have an instrumented pyramid adapter that can measure to some extent center of pressure, and it looks quite similar to it looks quite similar to Ava body center of pressure movement. The main difference that you typically see on amputation is that the landing of the prosthesis at heel strike tend to be much harder um, uh, compared to uh, non amputee individuals. But in terms of like path, it is actually pretty similar. Does the toe affect the path, the actuated toe? Yeah, absolutely. The toe does have an effect on it. And it was the biggest limitation of the previous device where we, can, we could push off a lot but with the ankle, but we felt that that energy was mostly wasted pushing people up instead of forward. All right. Well, thank you very much. Great morning session, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank all of our speakers and our and our moderator. Thank you so much. So a bit of a programming update. We did run a bit over today, and we want to make sure people get their break in because Zoom can be tiring. So we're going to push back the start of our next session until 2.50, okay? We push back full 10 minutes, okay? So people get a 10-minute break like was planned on the schedule. So feel free in that time. Head over to the spatial chat. Interact with your colleagues. Ask these speakers some great questions about their great talks. We will see you in 10.
Hello, everyone. Okay. So up first, I'm sure people are ready to go here. Got Coda up first. Make sure you're ready to share. Kristen, are we ready? Yep, we're about ready. One second here. Let's find what's Coda hops back in. We're I'm here. Fantastic. Great. Let me try at the top here. All right. There, I see you. You are now a co host and share away. Let's uh, first introduce uh, the moderator, uh, Chris Ariano, who's going to moderate the next three talks. Um, kind of more on the biological side of biomechanics. Chris is a, an assistant professor at the University of Houston. And um, he's, he has a long history of studying humans and uh, walking and running mechanics and a little bit of neural control. And did a postdoc stint in a, a muscle physiology lab with Tom Roberts to study shape change in muscle. So Chris's work really spans the topics that we'll hear about in this next uh, set of talks. Turn it over to you, Chris and Coda. All right, thank you, Greg. Uh, yeah, Chris here, I'll be your moderator. Just a kind of few friendly reminders. Uh, again, each talk is uh, stated for 20 minutes, so uh, 12 minutes ideally for the talk, and then eight minutes hopefully for the Q&A, okay? Uh, I'll do my best to field questions from both the chat, uh, YouTube, and if you'd like to uh, raise your hand and ask a question after the talk, I will make sure to call on you, okay? All right, first we have uh, Kota Takahashi. Uh, University of Nebraska at Omaha is going to be talking about uh, human mechanics of the feet. Koda. Uh, Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. And uh, Chris, can you see my screen okay? Yes, perfect. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, I think this is going to be a nice transition from uh, Tomaso's talk because I'm going to revisit some concepts that he introduced. So it's exciting that uh, uh, the order was set up this way. So I want to thank the Dynamic Walking Organizing Committee for inviting me for this uh, for this session. It's my second uh, Dynamic Walking. My first was in 2013. So a lot has happened since 2013. Uh, but I don't think uh, this audience needs any reminders about the importance of biomechanics to inspire wearable uh, device technology. So a lot of the many successful uh, designs of exoskeleton and prosthesis, I would argue that many of them have uh, been really deeply rooted in the biomechanical principles. And, uh, and I, again, want to thank Tommaso for shedding some light onto the foot. Uh, that's the area that I specialize in. Uh, and so I have two broad goals for today. Uh, I want to be able to uh, present to you some of our mechanistic studies uh, that relate foot structural properties and how that impacts energetics of walking from more of a biological actuator standpoint. And then the second uh, bullet point that I have here might be slightly misleading because it's not necessarily the next opportunity for engineering feet. It might just simply be revis uh, revisiting existing concepts, uh, but applied in a slightly different way. Uh, so as a foot enthusiast, it's been really interesting uh, to see the many success stories in running uh, that involves passive, simple devices that can augment uh, locomotion, uh, such as reducing energy costs. So based on the studies, uh, based on several different studies that you may read about, um, uh, the foot literature and the shoe literature uh, are doing really well in terms of running performance. Uh, so it can be found that anywhere between one to 4% reduction in energy cost uh, in running. Uh, and this could be, this could involve a prototype shoe, uh, like the one that Nike you developed uh, that reduced energetic cost of walking by 4%, or it could be uh, custom insoles uh, where you have uh, the same shoe and slight carbon fiber insole of different thicknesses to actually enhance performance. Right. So I, uh, one of the things that I want to uh, do today is that uh, we've seen all these success stories in running, uh, and my hope is that I can convince you that some of the same, uh, if not better, uh, performance enhancements can be achieved in walking, which is the area that I specialize in. So when we 
when we start talking about the foot and ankle, it's really important to um, start with a very simple concept. So uh, you have a calf muscle with the moment arm, uh, input moment arm, a uh, little r, and an external lever arm of the ground reaction force given by r. And the ratio of these two are simply the gear ratio. And gear ratio is, uh, is a simple way to control the angular rotation uh, of the segments that's rotating in space. So you can think of it as a foot trying to push off at the end of stance. Um, and one of the uh, neat ways or easy ways for assisted devices like feet uh, and shoes and insoles is that if you stiffen the foot, it's going to have a tendency to ex, uh, increase the external lever arm, and therefore it's going to increase the gear ratio, and therefore the increased gear ratio is going to contribute to a slower uh, rotation of the foot. Uh, and then if you're thinking from the muscle standpoint, you might be thinking, well, the muscle uh, will likely be contracting slower uh, due to that uh, simple mechanics. And in fact, in vivo studies uh, have shown uh, that um, uh, Increasing foot stiffness uh, through insoles or shoes can in fact uh, shift the force velocity operating regions. So I can think of two recent papers, one from our lab in 2016 that showed during walking, if you stiffen the foot with insoles, we can get a force velocity shift uh, towards the upward direction and the leftward direction, which basically means a slower muscle contraction leading to enhanced force. In a very recent study, um, from Sasha uh, Chicago uh, from Calgary at also showed the same thing in a different muscle, the gastrocnemius, uh, in a different walking task uh, uh, during, wa during running. So we showed it in walking, they showed it in running. So it's two different labs converging to the same idea and two different tasks gives us confidence that uh, the way that uh, we can enhance locomotion through shoes and insoles uh, is through this mechanism of the force velocity shift. And so we wanted to test um, the energetic benefit of the force velocity shift. So if you slow down the muscle contraction, that's all, um, typically thought of as a more economical uh, force contraction. Uh, so in a follow-up study to the study that we did in 2016, um, this study was led by my former master's student, Sam Ray, uh, where he used ultrasound imaging to study the soleus muscle contraction dynamics. Uh, he used three different uh, stiffnesses uh, of shoes of different, uh, or shoes plus carbon fibers of different thicknesses. Uh, and one of the most important things he did in this study, uh, not only he, did he measure uh, whole body energy costs, but he actually tested walking at several different speeds on one speed, 2.0 meters per second, which is really close to the walk around transmission speed. And the reason why that's important is that we know from the muscle mechanics literature, both from in vivo studies and and modeling studies uh, that when you walk faster, you have reduced ground contact time with the, uh, you have reduced ground contact time, uh, less time to develop force and the muscles contract faster and faster and faster leading to a very less uh, than optimal uh, muscle state, uh, which could uh, be thought of to increase the energy cost of locomotion. So we wanted to test that hypothesis. Uh, and the first hypothesis here is essentially a confirmation of what we already knew uh, from the literature, but we hypothesized that the greater foot stiffness and shoe stiffness will shift the soleus uh, muscle to a better state in the force velocity operating region, uh, which again means slower contraction with greater force uh, production. But the hypothesis too was that uh, we were expecting a greater metabolic benefit at the faster walking speed, simply because the muscle is operating less efficiently due to the fast walking speed. So just to orient you, this is an ultrasound image. Uh, and from the ultrasound image, we can identify the soleus area, which is uh, highlighted in the red. Um, and then so up above the screen, you're going towards the more superficial. Down towards the screen, you're going more deeper. Um, and we can see, uh, we can have a, a side by side image of the soleus and the red line uh, represents a single muscle fascicle. Uh, and you might be able to see the difference when you have no insole versus uh, a thick insole. Uh, and then you will actually definitely be able to see a faster contraction speed as the person walk faster. So this is the video playing now of 1.25 meters per second, which is a pretty standard walking speed. You might be able to see that on the right-hand side, the fascicles are contracting a little bit slower. Uh, and now the fascicles are yellow line walking faster. And so the fascicles are contracting much, much faster. 
So from these in vivo analysis, we can calculate uh, the velocity of the contraction uh, uh, from the ultrasound. And we have a model-based estimate for the soleus force. So to get that, uh, we took inverse dynamics calculation. We calculated ankle moment. I had a geometric model of the Achilles tendon moment arm. Uh, and then we assumed uh, that the force sharing among the plantar flexors were relative to the cross-sectional area. And then finally, we accounted for the pination angle uh, of the soleus fascicle uh, from the ultrasound. And so this is a bit uh, busy graph, so let me orient you. Okay, so I have three different walking speeds. Uh, Y-axis is the average soleus fascicle force, and the X-axis is the average fascicle velocity. So I'm gonna show you the data from the three stiffnesses uh, at the slowest walking speed, 1.25 meters per second. And uh, for your convenience, I indicated an arrow going, um, when you go from right to left, the uh, sti uh, stiffness is actually increasing. And so there, there you can see a leftward and an upward shift uh, and the force velocity operating vision. Uh, at the uh, two faster walking speed, it's the same idea. Uh, one thing you might be able to see right away is that as you walk faster, uh, the, uh, the soleus fascicle is shifting towards the right, uh, meaning that the uh, fascicle is contracting faster. And again, we think that this is a verification uh, that the muscle is shifting as force velocity operating region. And just as a further proof, uh, one of the things that was really interesting to us is that when we look at the soleus muscle activation across the different stiffnesses, there was no change in soleus muscle activation uh, with increased stiffness. So that's another indication to us that the enhanced force output was coming from the slower, uh, slower muscle contraction. Uh, now, some of you may be wondering, what about the force length operating region? We do have that data. Uh, we did not see a uh, difference in the force length operating region uh, using this type of similar analysis. So now to get at the whole body level, um, we have the three walking speeds. The y-axis is the whole body cost of transport from the indirect calorimetry data. X-axis is the uh, shoe or foot stiffness. And what you can see from the 1.25 meters per second is that uh, there was a metabolic increase of roughly 10%. Uh, and the most interesting thing is that the same insole that increased metabolic cost uh, at the slowest walking speed is the same insole that reduced the energy cost by 7.1%. Uh, and again, 2.0 meters per second is a really fast walking speed. And so this indicates uh, to us that uh, the effect of foot structural property on the calf muscle mechanics uh, is speed dependent. So going back to the gearing idea, uh, it's almost like a bicycle. So when you want to ride fast on a bicycle, you want to switch uh, gears to a higher setting. Uh, and that higher setting may not necessarily lead you to a uh, uh, economical state when you're going uh, at a pedestrian pace. So wanted to put uh, the 7% reduction in the context of passive uh, exoskeleton slash uh, insoles. Um, so many of you know about the uh, Collins, Sowicki, Wiggins uh, ankle exoskeleton that reduced metabolic cost by 7%. Uh, the Nike 4% shoe uh, uh, decreased by 4%. And so we're, we're basically in the ballpark is somewhere between shoe insoles during running uh, and the exoskeletons that uh, we have in the field. So some of the next opportunities, um, because we saw a speed dependent effects of stiffness, uh, one of the burning desires that I have is uh, if we can uh, have some kind of an engineering divide that can shift uh, gears automatically. So uh, Tomasa already um, gave us an example of a knee, a uh, prosthetic knee that could shift gears uh, very well. Uh, so I think it's just a matter of revisiting some existing technology. And I know that there's some variable stiffness prosthetic foot uh, uh, out there by uh, some of the members in the audience. So next follow-up stuff with this study, uh, we wanna be able to enhance function and the target population for this is uh, elderly. So older adults are, uh, have deficient ankle push-off uh, and pair force production. And we think that we can improve some of this force production uh, through just passive devices like insoles. So just really quickly want to 
uh, show you some pilot data, very preliminary, n equals three subjects, but we took uh, older subjects at level ground and also at five degree incline and kind of similar thing with the speed dependent effects of stiffness. Now we're getting a slope dependent effect of stiffness and that the highest stiffness was able to reduce the energy costs in older adults and three older adults by close to 12%. So we're very optimistic about uh, this type of analysis. And uh, I know I'm over my time, but I wa want your attention for one last minute. Um, and it's one of the areas that I wasn't able to talk about today, but I'm very passionate about um, is that uh, we've been developing tools to study uh, deformation of feet and how much energy is dissipated during that process with the ground contact. And uh, with, with our latest analysis, we're estimating about three, three joules of uh, work is dissipated uh, or net negative work three, of three joules. And if we extract, uh, extrapolate that out to like 10 minutes, uh, that's like 1800 joules. And so one of the burning uh, questions we have is where is this energy going from an engineering standpoint? So if it's energy is truly being dissipated, that has to go somewhere. It has to go to sound. It has to maybe be transferred. Uh, but one of the hypotheses that we're testing right now is uh, 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 negative work that's being dissipated by uh, by heat. Uh, so we have a thermal imaging camera and we're trying to uh, link uh, negative work and uh, temperature production of feet. Uh, uh, that uh, project is still ongoing, uh, but I know I am over my time, so I will finish here and I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Coach. A very interesting work. Uh, I'll fill some questions from, let's see, the chat first. All right, so let's see here. We have a question from uh, Lena Korbowski. Says, why does the medium stiffness orthosis seemingly increase metabolic cost? Why and why is there a speed effect? Yeah, so I'll, I, I'll answer the, the last part first. So, um, the speed effect, yeah, so you're referring to the um, the effect that at one speed, the same insole increased metabolic cost and the faster speed, it uh, reduced the metabolic energy cost. So the simplest answer I can give you right now, and the story gets more and more complicated if we start looking more and more into the data, uh, but the fastest speed, we think that the muscle was operating inherently in a less, uh, less than optimal state uh, and such that the shift in the force velocity was only meaningful. Um, at that fast walking speed. Now we're in the middle of trying to understand this further. So we looked at all the usual suspects like joint work, uh, joint moments. Um, to us, it really makes sense that the fast walking speed, we were able to reduce the energy cost. Uh, the story isn't as quite simple uh, and the uh, slower walking speed. Um, so we're open to ideas, but hopefully uh, more insights from musculoskeletal modeling might be able to help uh, my speculation as maybe that enhanced force um, might not be used properly by the body. Uh, and so some other uh, body parts like the proximal limbs might be co-contracting and increasing the metabolic cost. Uh, so Alina, thank you for that question and hope that answers the question. Yeah, uh, Koda, just to follow up on that question, you know, when, when you showed the force velocity curve and you, you're suggesting this kind of shift toward the zero point, right, where you have, you know, the muscle producing force while legs is changing relatively, uh, either small or not at all. Uh, at these faster speeds, is there potential for that greater force to take advantage of, of potentially stretching the tendon uh, and then maybe, you know, storing some energy and, and releasing it maybe at faster rates, some kind of, you know, maybe some power amplification happening? Chris, I love that question. Thank you for that. Uh, so, you, um, so as you were mentioning, the force enha uh, enhancement. So the muscle fascicles are producing higher forces, which means the tendons are also experiencing the forces. And what we see from the uh, uh, the joint uh, angle is that uh, the ankle is more dorsiflexed at faster walking speed with greater stiffness. So that might indicate uh, that uh, combined with the enhanced force, that the tendons uh, might be stretching more. So I think you're definitely onto that. Um, uh, uh, in this study, we didn't directly quantify uh, tendon forces and tendon displacement. Uh, so we can only kind of guess from the muscle fascicle data and the kind of overall muscle tendon unit data from the joint kinematics. Um, but uh, I, I would definitely say uh, that could be uh, another potential mechanism to reduce okay. the metabolic cost. All right, we have one more question here. Uh, I think Amos went through, hopefully that kind of uh, answered part of your question. 
But we have another question from Sam by Kim. Uh, says, nice talk for, for toe action's perspective. Stiff insole acts as a parallel spring. What do you think about the stiff insole helping toe actuation? Uh, so when you say toe actuation, uh, are you referring to the actuation of the biological toe flexors? I have no clue, but let's assume so. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's assume so. All right. So uh, my guess is that because the external lever arm is going to be increased, um, if, the, well, it's possible that the toe flexors uh, could actually increase force, uh, but some of that force, uh, as you're mentioning, uh, because there's a parallel spring, uh, that could take up some of the forces. So um, to answer your question, yes and yes, um, and no and no, uh, well, it's, it's certainly both possible. Uh, I can see both scenarios playing out, um, but I think uh, what we do need to do is be able to partition the uh, uh, moments and the energy from the insoles uh, versus the biological foot. Uh, and I don't think that's a trivial problem, uh, but yeah. it will be fantastic if we can get that. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, I encourage you to go back to the question by Amos Winter and same by Kip. They look they're very related. Uh, but for this time uh, constraint, we're going to go ahead and move on. Uh, thank you, Coda. Very interesting talk. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Yannicka uh, Swarner, who's going to be talking about kangaroo rats and muscle tendon actuation. Yannicka. We can see your presentation, but we do not hear you yet. Sorry, that's my technique. Oh, there we go. Uh, capabilities. Okay, so um, hi all. Thanks for having uh, having me today. My name is Yannicka, and uh, currently I'm a postdoctoral scholar in Dr. Monica Daly's lab at the University of California in Irvine. However, today I would like to talk about my earlier work that I've done at the University of Idaho in Craig McGowan's lab. So animals need to move. They need to move to find mates, to find food, or to prevent becoming food. And to survive predation, animals develop the whole area of tactics, including fast, unsteady behaviors like sprinting, jumping, or ducking out of harm's way. Kangaroo rats, bipedal hopping desert rodents, use vertical leaps to outjump strikes by snakes, propelling themselves up to over 15 times their hip height. And while airborne, these animals change orientation to take off in a newly acquired direction immediately after landing. Kangaroo rats are a perfect model species to study the mechanisms that allow them to make these impressive leaps, how they push towards extreme locomotor performances and to understand capabilities of the musculoskeletal system. Elucidating mechanisms the kangaroo rat uses for these performances crosses multiple organizational levels. And in today's talk, I would like to focus on two. To discuss jumping, I first discuss mechanisms on leg joint level, followed by a dive into muscle tendon level. During the talk, the organizational level will be reflected with an icon in the right upper corner. So first I would like to talk about jumping on joint level. And as in most cursorial animals, like for example, horses, goats, rabbits, you name it, the majority of the kangaroo rat musculature is located proximally on the hind limb. Consequently, many more of the muscles in the hind leg are actually acting on the hip and the knee joint compared to the ankle joint. Based on this, one might expect that most of the work is done at the knee or the hip joint. However, eventually the work has to be done against the ground. Otherwise, the animal can propel itself up. In order to investigate which joints are contributing to the kangaroo rat jump and how and if this contribution changes when an animal jumps higher, we aimed to calculate joint work for each hind limb joint. We staged jumps while kindly requesting our wild caught kangaroo rats to take off from a force plate and jump over obstacles of ranging heights. We digitize joints and use an inverse dynamics analysis that combines joint kinematics, ground reaction forces, and leg segment masses and inertias to obtain joint power and ultimately joint net work. We found that most of the work is measured at the ankle joint and that this is the case even when 
jump height increases. The pie charts represent relative joint contribution for an average low and medium and high jump for the hip, the knee, and the ankle joint. Since the animal has more proximal leg muscle mass, it's not quite what you would expect based on their anatomy. So the next step for us was to take a closer look at this anatomy. As the king of rubat ankle extensor is a biarticular muscle and therefore can transfer energy from proximal to distal joints. Based on previous literature, we know that king of rubat tendons are stiff, which suggests that king of rubat muscle tendon unit can also be used as struts. This, together with an almost complete lack of the soleus muscle, this creates a solely biarticular ankle extensor. When going back to the joint work figure, we now see that the work measured in the ankle joint, still reflected in blue, and this is the exact same data as shown in the other graph, up to 40% of work measured at the ankle is actually originating from more proximal muscles and transferred over the biarticular ankle extensor. Uh, as you can see, we averaged in the pie chart for a low, middle, and a high jump. To conclude on this organizational level, we found that on joint level, the ankle joint is responsible for most of the work, but that overall contribution to jump height stays relatively similar when jump height increases. When looking at the leg anatomy, we found that the biarticular nature of the echo extensor allows for transfer up to 40% and that this amount stays similar levels when increasing jump height. But obviously there is more. As king of rats use multiple mechanisms to achieve their jumps. And to explain what else is there, we have to go one organizational level lower. To the muscle and tendon level. Before I dive in, I have to talk a little bit about examples of mechanisms with which tendons and other elastic structures in the leg can increase joint, fire up, joint power outputs. And so please look at the example of three great jumpers, known all to be phenomenal jumpers. And if we look at the whole body power output, the kangaroo rat seems to miss out as the galago and the tree frog power outputs are several multiples of the power output of the kangaroo rat, which value was calculated for a 40 centimeter jump for one of our own animals. Let's compare um, these values to what is known as the power output for isolated skeletal muscle. I will reiterate here, muscles do work, tendons cannot, uh, but they can store and release energy over different time scales, meaning storing over a longer period of time, but releasing in a blink of an eye, thereby increasing power output on the whole body level. Now, let's compare the power outputs in black with the ones in red. Remember, we compare whole body power outputs with isolated muscle power outputs. Previously, it was suggested that if an animal had a power output exceeding this ex a skeletal muscle power output, the animal must use energy stored in elastic structures to increase their power output over this mechanical limit. This would suggest that our kangaroo rats won't require elastic energy storage and release for the laboratory jumps. However, this relationship is not as straightforward as even animals that don't go past this power output based on constraint and maximally activated muscles in lab conditions can use elastic energy storage for their movements. To find out how and how much, we, have, we must have a look at what muscles the motor of movements do. So we aim to investigate what happens at a muscle level by implanting sonar micrometry crystals, which can measure in real time how much muscles contract, and EMG crystals, which give a measure of muscle activity. We implanted these in the main ankle extensor, the lateral gastrocnemius, and the main knee extensor, the fastus lateralis. Um, crystals are not shown on this drawing. We aimed to investigate what the role of the LG and the VL contribute to the jump and how this changes when an animal jumps higher. We predicted that as task demand increases, muscle strain in both the muscles would increase too. We found that looking at EMG activity, that the relative EMG activity in the VL as well as in the LG increased significantly with increasing jump height. And when looking at strain results, we saw that strain in both the VL 
in graph A and the LG in graph B decreased significantly, meaning there was more shortening with jump height. Together with the information on the previous slide, this means that to jump higher, muscles shorten more. Um, and as a result of a higher jump, there is also more muscle activity. This suggests that generally speaking, more fascicles are activated and they shorten more when jumping higher. But before we go into what elastic structures in the leg do, I want to talk a little bit more about this motor, the muscle. And in particular on where they prefer to operate as there is a known shortening velocity optimum for muscles, if we look at this first velocity curve, um, the red curve, we can see that for a given muscle shortening velocity, there is an operating force and a corresponding power up the, the blue line. What this graph suggests is that there is a sweet spot where the muscle operates at intermediate velocity for optimal power, which occurs at isometric contraction for max force output. To get higher a power output is vital that the animals can let their muscles operate around this gray bar, which for this example is arbitrarily um, put on this graph. Now, we know a little bit more how muscles want to operate. Let's see what happens and how tendons can help keep muscles in this gray bar. As we asked our second question, how does the Achilles tendon contribute to these jumps? But before I give the answer, um, I told you that kangaroo rats have, uh, are suggested to have very stiff tenants. After the previous study came out, collaborators found that kangaroo rat tendons are more compliant than initially thought. When we initially calculated the potential elastic energy storage and release capabilities of kangaroo rat tendons, we found a value of 3.75% uh, for 0.5 four meter jump. We used the generic value of elastic modulus from mammalian tendon of one gigapascals. When implemented the measured value of elastic modulus for kangaroo at Achilles tendon, which is about 400 megapascals, we found an energy recovery percentage of 9.4%. That is a difference, but it still suggests that elastic energy storage and recovery is not the main driver for these impressive jumps. It does indicate though, the kangaroo rat tendons are more compliant than initially thought, which is an important piece of information to understand the role tendons plays in these jumps. If we now look at the muscles and muscle tendon shortening, we see a difference in shortening in the muscle in the dashed line and the whole muscle tendon unit, which is a solid line. This figure shows the LG muscle and muscle tendon unit over a whole jump. You can see that the muscle tendon unit shortens more than the muscle. As tendon cannot shorten by themselves, um, they can only shorten when they're previously stretched. To show why this difference in shortening is advantageous for muscles, I will pull up the next figure. We see here that the fastest lateralis, that thigh muscle, uh, its strain rate in the black solid line, we see the knee angle, the small dashes, and the angular velocity of the knee joint in the big dashes. The gray shaded horizontal area indicates the measured more optimal range of shortening velocity for kangaroo rats, or short the identified sweet spot where muscles want to operate to produce force. We can see that the black solid line, the strain, uh, strain rate passes through this spot for a little while, meaning that the muscle at that time operates at more optimal conditions. When we compare the time that this muscle operates in this sweet spot over all trials, we can identify a time range in which these muscles operate there, visualized by this bar graph. When looking at the lateral gastrocnemius or LG, uh, a muscle with a longer free tendon when compared to the VL muscle, we see that during this individual trial, but also when looking at all trials, the muscle spends more time in this sweet spot. This means that the relatively long tendon that is attached to the LG facilitates optimal conditions for shortening in this muscle, but does not seem to happen in the VL to that extent. But as said before, it matters to the muscle when to have optimal conditions for it to be effective for power output. So therefore we plotted as a third graph, the grunt reaction forces, and we can see that the tendon facilitates more optimal conditions at times of higher force. So now we know that tendons can, besides store and release energy, also enable muscles to operate at more optimal conditions. 
So to summarize, muscles shorten more when kangaroo rats jump higher and they increase relative activity, suggesting to record more muscle fascicles to jump higher. We also found that kangaroo rats do use their large free Achilles tendon to allow their ankle extensive muscles to operate longer at more favorable conditions when comparing to the PL muscle that does not have this long free tendon. So tendons can influence muscle tendon unit dynamics in different ways as well, but due to our experimental design, we can only highlight these for now. To recap, kangaroo rat ankles have the highest work outputs when measured through inverse dynamics analyses, but that energy is largely originated from more proximal muscles. And the Achilles tendon is more confined than originally thought and allows for more elastic energy storage and recovery, as well as it allows for decoupling of muscle shortening and joint angle velocities, thereby allowing the muscle to operate under more optimal conditions, indicating that the compliance in the MTU allows for simultaneously transfer of energy, elastic energy storage and release, and increasing the capabilities of the muscles, uh, indicating the joint role muscles and tendons have in these kangaroo red jumps. The kangaroo rat escape response provides a unique opportunity to study the link between morphology and function across organizational scale. Although kangaroo rats in the lab are not scared enough, I guess, to jump um, their maximum performances, these studies of submaximal jumps provide a foundation for understanding principles governing the mechanics of locomotor performances, and they do explore the limits of performance. But there is much more to discover on how animals achieve extreme performances or on how they navigate complex three-dimensional terrain. We can explore this further on the organizational levels that I talked about here, but also on even smaller organizational levels, all the way to cell or molecular level, as we are still facing challenges to integrate mechanistical findings across organizational level. And with that, I would like to thank my funders, collaborators, and the McGowan Lab, which now has a new location as it moved to California and is now part of the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine. Thank you all for listening and thank you for the organizers to invite me. And although I didn't talk about tails today, um, I'm happy to talk about kangaroo rat tails anytime. So if interested, I will be walking around in the spatial chat during breaks and during the poster session. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Yannicka. Fascinating talk. So let's start off with a few questions here. Got a couple of questions from the, uh, the chat. Let's see if I can pull that up. Okay, let's see here. We have uh, one from, the first one here was from Glenna, uh, Glenna Clifton. Thanks for the talk, uh, Yannicka. Do you see any pre-jump adjustments? For example, further crouching associated with higher jumps allowing for longer contact times to contribute to shifts in contraction velocity? The video with the snake seemed to show very little uh, jump prep. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. I hope to catch you in the spatial chat for sure. Um, so it's interesting that you bring that up. So in the, in the lab, we see like only a very low uh, percentage of animals that do um, a, a jump prep. And in the lab, they, they have time for that, right? Because we're not snakes, we're not gonna eat them. But in the field, as you saw in the last video that you saw, um, these animals, what they want is be out of the way as fast as they can. So they, they don't do any counter movements like humans would do if they jump up. Um, but don't forget that kangaroo rats are crouched. So they could have like an initial state of some pre-stretch of their tendons just by sitting. I hope that that answers your question, Glenn. All right, thank you. So uh, another question here from uh, Steve Collins. Uh, he asked, does lower reliance on series elastic uh, elasticity allow kangaroo rats to initiate jumps more quickly than, say, frogs? Um, I, I truly do not know the answer to that question, but I, I would totally, uh, I'm totally open to chat about that more in the spatial chat. Yeah, I think to, to follow up, it, it's kind of interesting because you showed that the, the elastic energy storage was quite small, which was surprising to me. It was, you know, at most, what, 34% you showed? Uh, and so I, it just made me think about, even though they have kind of a, a smaller amount of elastic energy storage, might, that, may they, might, that, um, might there be a trade-off between how quickly they can release that energy? So is there oh, a really totally. slowly? 
they, they release it more rapidly, which may, they may still be able to benefit from, you know, powering these jumps. Yep, I agree. Okay, one more question before the next talk. Let's see here. Uh, It says here, if you're going to design an animal jump, uh, design an animal to jump in the best way, quick is highest, would you prefer more compliant tendon for greater decoupling or longer lever arms for shorter muscle velocity? This is from Dr. Sh uh, oh, I don't know who it's from, but from YouTube. Oh, that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, the thing is with, uh, with more compliant tendons, and I'm just going to talk this through because obviously I do not have the right answer here. Um, if you have more compliant tendons, you also have a, a risk that it quicker breaks. Um, I mean, that was the whole um, foundation for assuming that kangaroo rats have very stiff tendons, that it was like a, a safety factor that they had to take care of. But now we actually know that they're very compliant, but also really tough. Um, so you can have a tendon that's relatively compliant, but it's really, really tough. Um, so I think that that changed at least my view a lot on, on what you need for your jump. All right. Thank you. That was from Dr. Peter Adamczyk. So if you'd like to follow up on the spatial chat, uh, a lot more interesting questions that I couldn't get to today, but thank you so much. Very interesting talk. Okay. So next we have Dr. Jenna Monroy, and she's going to talk to us about muscles as, uh, as tunable springs. Jenna? All right, we're seeing that you're perfect. We're all set. All right, can you hear me? You can see everything? Yep, perfect. All right. Thank you all for inviting me and, and sticking around and listening to my talk today. All right. All right, so like so many of us here today, I am also interested in how humans and animals adapt to a constantly changing environment of uneven terrain and unexpected perturbations. And as we'll find out, this is largely due to the fact that muscles are highly versatile, adaptable materials, right? They, they can function not only as motors, but also as springs, shock absorbers, brakes, or struts. And, and their properties are both activation and history dependent. And yet we still don't know where this adaptability comes from and which makes it very difficult to predict force during dynamic movements. And so I hope that the ideas that I present here today inspire the design of new wearables, new robotics that can emulate the adaptability of muscles. So where does my research fit in here? I am interested in bridging the gap between what's going on at the level of the sarcomere with whole muscle mechanics and dynamic animal movement. And I loved Yannicka's talk because she too has emphasized the importance of of learning about muscles across scales. And the idea here is that if we can understand the underlying molecular mechanisms, we can create better models that can accurately predict muscle force during natural cyclical behaviors. Now, there's accumulating evidence that the sarcomeric protein Titan can function as a tunable spring in active muscle. And so the goal of my research is to really find out how. Now, let me just remind you that Titan is the third most abundant protein in muscle after actin and myosin. And so what we're looking at here is a half sarcomere. The rest of the sarcomere would be out towards the right side of your slide. And um, what you can see is that Titan is this yellow structure here and it spans an entire half sarcomere. So it interacts with the actin filament at the Z-disc and it runs all the way through the myosin core to the M line where it interacts with another Titan filament. Now I am particularly interested in this I-band region of Titan, which is composed of three domains, this proximal IG domains, the N2A, which is a specific unique sequence only to skeletal muscles and the PVK domain, named for the amino acids that it's composed of. Now together, these segments function as a molecular spring. Now I'm gonna simplify my talk today and I'm gonna call these regions X, Y, and Z. And that way we don't have to remember all these different letters and numbers and things like that. All right, so the proximal IG segment are, is considered the X region, the N2A is considered the Y, and the PVK domain is called Z. 
All right, so what do we know? We, it is well accepted that Titan functions as a molecular spring in passive muscle. And so again, on the right-hand side, we see our half sarcomere and we see our three domains in the orange, this little red dot and the green filament. Now, as a passive muscle is stretched, this low passive force here is associated with the initial straightening of this X domain. And then followed by the exponential increase in passive force, which is associated with the extension of, whoops, of the Z domain, of the Z domain there. So in its passive state, Titan is far too compliant to contribute to active muscle stiffness. And so what we need to really figure out is what's changing in Titan so that it can contribute to active muscle force and stiffness. All right. So there are several proposed mechanisms, but the one I'm gonna to talk to you about today has received traction more recently. So recent work by Dutta et al. showed this, the unique Y region that sits in between the X and the Z regions binds to actin in a calcium dependent manner. Now, just to remind you, calcium floods the cell during activation and it regulates the formation of cross bridges. And what I'm telling you here is that in addition to cross bridges, calcium regulates the binding of this Y region of Titan with actin, which would then eliminate the straightening of this X domain and engage the Z domain at shorter lengths. So this led to the hypothesis that upon activation, this Y actin binding should shorten Titan, Titan's equilibrium length and increase Titan and active muscle stiffness. So in my lab, to test this hypothesis, we use ex vivo muscle experiments to characterize specific muscle properties. And today I'm gonna to talk, show you data from two mutant mice. I'm gonna show you data from a Y mutant. So it has a very small deletion in the Y region and you'll see this little image here to denote the Y mutant. And I'm gonna show you data from a Z mutant in which 75% of the Z region is deleted. And I'll use this image here to show the Z mutant. Now, to characterize the elastic properties of active and passive muscles, we performed rapid unloading experiments in which the muscles and were activated and passively stretched to the same initial stress and then rapidly unloaded to the same load. And that's what you see in this first, this top graph up here. And then what we do is that we can measure the recoil for a series of different loads for each muscle when it's active and when it's passive. And so using the initial stress, the change in stress, and the strain, we can estimate the stress strain relationships for muscles in their activated and passive states. All right, so this graph here shows data from a wild type muscle. And what we're looking at is the stress strain relationship of the muscle when it's passive in the dashed lines and active in the solid line. And what we find is that there's a 15 to 20% leftward shift of the stress strain relationship towards shorter lengths Plus we see that when these muscles are activated, there's a nearly threefold increase in stiffness. However, the Y mutant muscles show a very different result. So once again, on the right, we're seeing our stress strain relationships with our wild type in blue, and I've added the Y mutant data in red. So, and what we see in the Y mutant, there's, there's absolutely no leftward shift upon activation, nor is there an increase in stiffness and these results suggest that the Y region that is missing, the piece of the Y region that is missing in the Y mutant is necessary for the shift in equilibrium in length and the increase in stiffness with activation. And this is consistent with the hypothesis that that Y region of, of Titan is binding to actin at the onset of activation. But what about the Z mutants? Now remember that the Z mutants have a really large deletion in that Z region. And one would expect that with that big of a deletion, you would see that both passive and active stiffness should be greater in the Z mutant compared to wild type muscles. But we actually see a surprising result. First off, 
So we're looking at the Z mutants in purple. And again, we have our wild types here in blue is that the passive data actually look what you might expect. Due to the shorter Z region, we do see that the Z mutant is passively stiffer. But when these muscles are activated, we see that these of the active Z mutant muscles show a 7% smaller leftward shift and are roughly 30% less stiff than wild type muscles. And so the question becomes, what's going on here? Um, whoops, sorry. Um, while we don't actually, sorry, I advanced a little too quickly. Hold on. All right, so while we don't actually know um, what's going on, it's likely that there's, um, a compensatory mechanism going on in the Z mutant to make these muscles actually less stiff. And it could mean that there's some upper limit to active muscle stiffness. All right, so what does this mean? The data presented here show that the Y region of Titan is essential for tuning the Titan spring, perhaps by binding to actin upon muscle activation. And it suggests that this Z region of Titan is responsible for the stiffness of the activated muscles. And this molecular mechanism can explain not only isolated muscle properties, but also muscle behaviors in whole animals. In fact, we see that this mechanism can explain properties of muscles that have eluded traditional muscle models, such as the increased force and low energy costs of eccentric contractions and muscle force and work during dynamic length changes. Now, this is particularly interesting because many muscles undergo stretch shortening cycles during natural movements, as we've heard today. And we know that enhancement of force with stretch and depression of force with shortening are critically important during in vivo movements. Now, recently, we sought to understand the effect of doublet stimulation on the force and work output of muscles. And so using the work loop technique, we can actually simulate locomotion by activating a muscle while subjecting it to cyclical length changes. And in these graphs, on the top graph, you can see the stretch shortening cycle and the red dots indicate when the muscle are being, is being stimulated. And the bottom graph shows the corresponding change in force. Now, I mentioned doublet potentiation. And what I mean by that is that adding a doublet is the addition of a single stimulus at the beginning of a train of stimuli. And what we find is that when a single doublet stimulus is added, we see a nonlinear increase in force. And this phenomenon has been known for many years, and yet it cannot be explained by crossbred mechanisms. And we've just kind of left it there, not really knowing how it, how it happens. And so what we can do is that we can plot the muscle stress by the muscle strain to measure the work of the muscle during a cycle of activity. And so what we're looking at is the work loop of a wild type muscle on the top and a Y mutant on the bottom. And the black lines indicate when no doublet has been added and the, and the colored lines, blue for the wild type and red for the Y mutant, show when a doublet has been added. And so what we're seeing here is that in wild type muscles, there's a 50% increase in network with, with just this addition of a single stimulus in the muscle. But yet in the wild, in the Y mutant, we see less than 5% increase in network. And so these data suggest that this small, tiny Y mutation gets rid of the doublet effect of completely and emphasizes the need for that little Y region to change the stiffness and of our Titan molecules. So together, these rapid unloading experiments and the work loop experiments demonstrate that Titan is both a passive and an active spring in muscle. We see that Titan is compliant when muscles are passive, they get stiffer when muscles are activated and its stiffness can change with activation. And so this brings us to sort of a classic equation that you see in all muscle physiology textbooks that total force should be equal to passive force plus active force. And we've all seen sort of our force length relationship that demonstrates that. And this implies that these elements come from different parts of our muscle, but yet, 
what we're showing here is that perhaps this equation needs to be modified to represent the tunability of Titan and how it contributes to both passive and active force. And so I'm going to leave you with some questions. What needs to be done next? Certainly, our classic Hill models and others, they lack a critical element whose stiffness and equilibrium length depend on muscle activation. And if we incorporate this added element, we might do a better job of predicting muscle force and work during dynamic movements. And likewise, a tunable spring could potentially simplify control and provide robustness under varying conditions for wearable prosthesis and perhaps to inspire the design of new robotics that emulate muscle-like properties. And so with that, I'd like to thank many undergraduates in my lab, my collaborators and funding sources, and I would be happy to take any questions. Wow, Jenna, that was amazing. I, I, I need to update my, uh, my lecture for, uh, for biomechanics. Uh, very, very interesting work. Uh, there are several questions, but, but I'm curious about one first. Okay. In, uh, in the experiment where you did the double potentiation, what, what does that do exactly? Does that kind of flood the muscle with more calcium prior to the, to the original stimulation? So definitely, definitely you would expect there to be more um, calcium coming in with a single stimulus. Now it's interesting because what you see is a transient increase in calcium, right? But that calcium actually drops off really quickly because you just put in one single stimulus, right? But the idea here is that the initial burst of calcium in there could cause Titan to bind to actin, but it persists for hundreds of milliseconds afterward, which could be due to the Titan still being attached. But if it were cross bridges, you would expect them to just, to, not, to actually just um, unattach when the calcium actually goes away. I see. Okay, first question here from uh, Charlotte. Uh, the question is, do the mutant mice have locomotor or other motor deficits that you see? Yes, and, and so the short answer to this is yes. So the Y mutant, it definitely is troublesome in some ways because it, um, it is smaller, its muscles are smaller, and it has a, definitely an awkward, awkward gait. Um, but we've also shown that they're able to jump. And, um, and so other um, uh, work out of Kisa Nishikawa's lab have shown that they, they can walk, they can, um, they can actually jump, but, um, and we're seeing that these changes are likely due to these changes in muscle stiffness. Okay, another question here from Zaid uh, Shah. This is awesome, thank you so much. Uh, can we capture these new findings by adding nonlinear elements and active elements in the existing muscle models? I would like to see so. So this is, this is the next step, right? And I encourage you to go see a poster out of Kisa Nishikawa's lab where they are doing just that. So um, yes, I encourage that. Okay, we have one last question here from Christian uh, Jakubowski. She's asking, uh, how does the stiffness from uh, Titan compare to the stiffness from uh, muscle short range stiffness from the attached cross bridges? Are, uh, are, they, uh, are they similar in scale? Do you think they scale similarly with activation? Great talk. <laughs> This is, this is an excellent question, okay? And I would say that there's, there's a, parsing that out is actually quite difficult, right? Um, and, and asking whether or not your short range stif stiffness is just due to your cross bridges is also um, kind of difficult. Um, but I would say that um, in fact, your Titan is contributing more, more stiffness than we know. So the things that we do know is that Titan stiffness actually um, increases before we even see cross bridges start to form. And so we start to see the effect of this increase in Titan before we actually see the, the increase in force. Okay, that was great talk again, beautiful work. Uh, I'd like to uh, just invite everyone to the spatial chat if you have other questions. Uh, we're uh, about uh, just uh, ending on time here. So again, I'd like to thank uh, Coda, Yannicka uh, and Jennifer, uh, amazing set of talks here. Thank you so much.
Fantastic. So thank you so much, everyone, for a great session. And, and uh, we, we, we are on track in terms of timing or programming note. So as I said in the space in the chat, our uh, our panel session, which is next, will be at 405. So push back 10 minutes from the original time. That means you'll have 15 minutes, glorious 15 minutes in the spatial chat to go and chat with people. OK, so uh, for everyone's convenience, the spatial chat is in the chat. You, the link's there along with the password. So I look forward to seeing you all there. See you all soon. So a programming note to anyone who's sticking around in, uh, in the Zoom chat here. I'm doing the best I can to have the YouTube algorithm pick up my screen for what's being broadcast live. Now, it's got a bit of a mind of its own, so sometimes it finds you eating incredibly interesting. So if you wish, Andy, yes, always very interesting to look at. So, if, but if you do not wish to be accidentally broadcast eating, this is a great time to turn off your camera in this room if you would like. Um, but I'll do my best to distract it with kind of hand motions, all right? Hey, Christian, it's looking good. Fantastic. So so we will get our, our panelist speakers in a couple minutes beforehand. Are you all set to go? Yeah, I think so. We're, I think one thing we should try and do is pin the speakers yeah. somehow um, so that um, if there's dialogue between what, what might be a lot of people still in Zoom, that mm -hmm. it doesn't flip the panelists to different spots in the grid. You know what I mean? Yes. So that won't be a problem. Are you able to pin? Yes. So, uh, so, so just for everyone's uh, benefit here. So, like, it'll be fine for everyone in Zoom here. Everyone, hello in the, in the YouTube, uh, in in the YouTube live stream. They might get a slightly different experience where it might just show the people being who are speaking uh, at a given time. Yeah, that's cool. To do. So anyway, so yes, the short answer. I think will be fine. So. All right. Okay. Then, Great. See you soon. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to get the audio from Zoom to turn off without me having to actually leave the Zoom room. <laughs> so, so if you, so for those who are new to Zoom, hello, welcome. I am your IT support sp specialist for today. So, what? Go down to the lower left corner of your Zoom of your Zoom window, and you'll see your audio little mute button. Okay, and if you click on that, it muted me when I clicked on it. Do you see that? Heard it. Yeah, but I, I think that Kristen means the same with the problem that I have. I want to stay in the Zoom session, but I yeah. also want to go to spatial chat and I cannot ah. mute Zoom that I don't hear oh. that over my speakers anymore. Oh, mute Zoom. Okay. okay. <laughs> I mute the Zoom itself. Well, everybody, well, you're, you're putting me through my IT paces today. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, I mean, you can always leave the Zoom room if you wish. I mean, you can get back anytime. There's plenty of space and you will have a password to get in. If you need it, reduce audio volume. Yeah, yeah. Or you can change the audio output. Maybe the special. The, the song, you're talking about the special audio settings in like Windows or something, where you can change the audio outputs per uh, individual app. Maybe. Maybe if, that's. If you go to audio settings yeah. in the room. So if you if next to the mute button or the video button, you click on the carrot. At, at the bottom of the menu is either yeah. video settings or audio settings. So both yeah. the same. Then on the left hand side, the third one down is audio. You click on audio and then uh, it as your speaker, a speaker that's not working, or you turn down the speaker volume all the way, like saying by was saying. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for your collective tech support. So. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Kisa, tighten, tighten, tighten. <laughs> How are you? Uh, okay. We're having big, very big family adventures. But I don't know if I, if I, I sh share them with all 72 participants. <laughs> are you in, uh, uh, are you in? We're not in Finland right now. And we're not going to Finland this summer. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, yes, it is too bad. It is too bad. If you want to know our story, go to saskia.org. I think I know, I think I know everything. Okay. I think I'm going to go take a nap for my 10 minutes here. Anyway, is, um,
Titan, Titan, Titan. Is it Titan still winding, or is it is it is that is that still? Um, it's definitely still winding. Like, yeah. you know, actually, there was a really interesting interchange on Twitter because yeah. somebody made a movie of the Titan winding, a oh, really, really? Good animation. And then there was this really big. Um, you, somebody on your team did that. No, no, no. Some random person. Well, Peter Clockwork is his Twitter. I can't hear you. It's like I I do not know what it is about. Yannicka needs to mute herself. Baffled. I made this work one point. Uh, yeah, actually, the Zoom room. We should go to the spatial chat and talk to each other. This is what's made for this purpose. Right? I, 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 I would recommend the spatial chat if you wouldn't mind. Uh, that way, I, mean, I, I can't I can't force stop, stop you from being broadcast to the YouTube to the world uh, from here. But, but, but so we'll, I'll meet you on spatial chat. And I have to figure out how to get there, man. That's going to take me half an hour. So there's so uh, Andy. I'll put if you look in the you click the chat at the bottom. I put just again the link to the ch the spatial chat right there. You just click on that. Okay. Uh, there's, there's the password for you, and let me know if you need any more help, okay? We'll find each other there, Kisa. Bye-bye. Okay. <sighs> okay, now I mute myself in Zoom. Somebody else with us too. I don't know who it is. Second, I just whoop. Hey, Keith, do you need help or something? You good? All right, one second.
So we are in the last last two minutes or so before our panel discussion. Let's get, uh, well, I guess we'll get set up here and our esteemed guests. So let's, uh, oh, I, I see Steve here. Fantastic. Let me start pinning you guys to the, to the gallery view. Yo. No, no, you don't this want it. No, no, I said yo. Yo, yo. Yo. Yeah, yo. <laughs> Hello. That pin. All right, and Kisa. Add pin. Songbei, I see Songbei, fantastic. And finally, our moderators, a moderator extraordinaire, Greg. Where are you? So I can't see anybody's video except my own in, you, in Zoom, which is mm. weird. Interesting. I've pinned. I'm not sure what what uh, what what Steve and uh, Kisa and and Songbei can see. I I see the four of us currently in the top here, all all pinned together. Okay. Let's I see, see you in the background, and then when Greg talks, I see Greg. Yeah, Greg, could you could you count down backward from ten for me for a second? Oh, I 10, see. Ten, nine, eight. Slower. Where I find you. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six. Uh, uh, pin. Okay. All right, and I will remove my own pin. All right, so I think we're ready to go. We, I, I believe I have all four of us all pinned, all four of you guys all pinned and ready to go. Okay. All right, well, welcome back from Spatial Chat. Um, we're gonna start off a, uh, a panel discussion here with uh, three senior members of the Dynamic Walking community. We've got uh, Dr. Kisa Nishikawa from Northern Arizona, and Steve Collins from Stanford, and Sangbae Kim from MIT. And um, really, the goal here is we, we have some questions that that we came up with uh, as a group beforehand that that we can go to. We also have some questions that came through the spreadsheet from from all of you. And um, questions during the the panel are also welcome through the chat, or you can raise your hand. Um, but really, you know, the idea here is to get perspectives from, from people who have uh, been around the field for, for a bit of time and, and hear, their, hear their ideas on some of the things they've seen today and things that they're working on in their lab um, as a way to get conversation rolling as, as we move then into the poster session, which, which will come up in about an hour from now. So I think j just to start things off, um, what I wanted to do is give each of the panelists a chance to introduce themselves a little bit more. And, you know, maybe just as a first prompt, it would be great to hear from each of you sort of what the most exciting project or projects in your lab currently are and, and, and why, you think, why you think those projects are important. So let, let's start out with, we'll start out with Kisa. Kisa, do you want to introduce yourself and say a few words? Hi, yes, I'm Kisa Nishikawa. I've been at Northern Arizona University. This is actually my 31st year. So I like to say that I was a baby when I started do it, teaching and doing research there. Um, and, you know, I've been coming to dynamic walking, I think probably on and off for about 10 years. I'm trying to think when, where I first met Andy. I think it was in 1995 in uh, Columbus, Ohio at an AM, AM meeting or something like that, or it might've been math biology. And Andy is really, you know, we've been talking about these Titan ideas for a long time. Um, I'm really interested in the adaptability and versatility of muscles so similar to what Jenna Monroy said in her talk. And I think we really don't understand how they work. Um, 
the ideas that we're thinking about now, um, actually we have a collaboration with Monica Daly and we're modeling Monica's beautiful in vivo uh, perturbed and unsteady locomotion data on guinea fowls walking in and running on treadmills. And what that's teaching us is that muscles are tunable materials and activation tunes their stiffness and damping. And what that view inevitably leads to is that if a muscle is a tunable material, you have to have a deformation to get a force. So the brain can think about how it wants to tune the material properties, but it can't make the force happen. We, ca we, have a, we call that instructive versus permissive. We think commands from the nervous system permit muscle force to develop appropriately and humans can learn to make what they want to happen happen, but it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a, a command like to a, you know, voltage command to a, an electric motor. Um, so what are we doing in the lab that we're really excited about? We have uh, muscle models based on Titan that are doing really good jobs of predicting unsteady force during dynamic movements in, um, in vivo. And we wanna um, continue building those and testing them. And um, yeah, so we're excited to continue to discover how muscles adapt movement and the role that they play in control of movement in humans and animals. That's great. Um, I think some key words that I'm hearing there that I think other analysts might also be able to comment on from their own work, adaptability, versatility of actuators, um, and how sort of properties of actuators link to behavior in, you know, in animals and, and machines. Let's, um, let's go to Steve Collins next. Sure. Steve, tell hey. us a bit about you, yourself, and your lab, and what you guys have been up to lately. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Well, I'm Steve Collins. I'm a professor here of mechanical engineering at Stanford. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been uh, enjoying the dynamic walking community for a long time now. Um, I, so, you know, my, my lab is focused on designing exoskeletons and prosthetic limbs that improve people's uh, mobility. And uh, we've been really focused on the design process itself for, uh, for the last decade or so, uh, uh, developing new tools to make to make it easier to answer the question, I, I think is still the hardest and most important question in, in this domain, which is uh, what does the person need from the device? And um, it's, it's really challenging because as we saw in, in the talks this morning, the biological system we're trying to interact with is really complicated down, right down to the behavior of, uh, you know, small molecules within a single sarcomere and muscle. Uh, we, we're still trying to figure out how to explain that. So, and, and, and as also was convincingly uh, stated today, the behavior of these little elements in our actuators influence system behavior in meaningful ways. And, and so um, this makes it really hard for us to intuit good solutions for these designs. It makes it hard to simulate uh, use simulations to predict people's actual response to these kinds of devices. So um, we're, we're trying a, an empirical approach where we can uh, get through different guesses and checks as fast as possible uh, in our laboratory. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I actually have lots of things. I, I, I found the, the, the talks this morning really interesting and I have lots of ideas that I hope we get a chance to talk about. Yeah, I think uh, once we... Once we go to Songbei and get his overall sort of uh, 20,000 foot view of, of you know, what he thinks is interesting these days, we, we can touch on interesting things that you all saw in the talks and try to connect them. I think one thing I hear, I hear Steve saying, which I'm already thinking about uh, how it might connect with Kisa's work is this idea of high throughput experimentation. And, and I wonder, I've often wondered recently whether that and things like machine learning techniques that are now coming online can help us learn even more about, about muscle and potentially even extract muscle models that engineers can use to design better machines. So I'm, I'm gonna switch over to Songbei now. Songbei, would you like to introduce yourself and just a quick, quick little thing. thoughts? Greg, a quick thing, you, you got a big echo somehow. 
Okay. I think I'm in a room with not much in it. Maybe I'll just try to talk lower. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Sangbae. I'm Sangbae Kim. I've been at uh, MIT 11 years. Uh, don't remember exactly, but I've been, uh, uh, I, I was in the dynamic uh, walking conference 2010, I think. And then that's how I uh, get into the community. It was just a fun in interaction last uh, 10 years or so. Um, I got into this bio, biomechanics slash robotics field when I was at Stanford working with Mark Kukowski. I uh, worked on sticky bar with the directional adhesive and sleep inspired like a running robot, like ice crawl, things like that. And uh, that's how I got into this, this area and uh, I had so much fun. Last 10 years, 11 years or so, I've been mostly focusing on quadrupedal robot development. So uh, the key, the you probably heard from the MIT Cheetah series, there's a like MIT Cheetah 1, 2, 3, and the Mini Cheetahs. Now, about 12 Mini Cheetahs are outside MIT. They're uh, you know, used for researchers. Um, we started building community. And uh, the, the key idea around the MIT Cheetah was really changing actuation paradigm from this precision-driven, uh, trajectory tracking-driven, trying to solve everything based on uh, position control, which is, is a standard, still standard in the industry. And then that's how our uh, academia has been using robot. And that, that's a really not how you're supposed to use an a actuator uh, when it comes to outside mobile situation where precision is important, but not as important as a collision uh, absorption, uh, force control, uh, direct force control, reliable force control, low inertia, uh, uh, and so on. So. We've been kind of like changing uh, paradigm shift uh, using electric motors and uh, uh, achieving like animal level efficiency, uh, cost of transport. Uh, so uh, somebody, we, we kind of claim that we're a like hydraulic uh, robot killer. Um, anyway, so, we, you know, last five, six years, we've been uh, more focusing on like control. So MPC, uh, model predictive control combined with the whole body dynamics is sort of our bread and butter. Um, recently, we're excited about um, using this kind of paradigm, actuation paradigm for uh, manipulation as well. As you probably know, manipulations are uh, no, known to be terribly slow because the same reason, like all these actuators are very stiff and high inertia. So you, you're not uh, afford to approach object with uh, some significant velocity, which animals are doing all, all the time. I ask you to grab something in your table Measure the velocity of collision is really high. We just don't know. We just don't realize it. So we're really excited about uh, applying the same idea in the manipulation domain. It's a lot more challenging because the ground, uh, ground is much, much heavier than your cell phone or your cup. Um, another thing we're excited about is we're actually developing bipedal locomotion uh, algorithm and robots. So not much we can publish at this point, but I'd uh, love to hear more about it. And uh, I'm excited to engage in more uh, deep conversation. Thank you. Okay, great. That was a good, I think a good opening volley there. Um, you know, Steve tried to link some of what he said to talks that we saw today. And I, I wonder if, uh, if any of the other panelists kind of were inspired by some things they saw in the talks today or triggered uh, connections between talks when they were watching. Let's just, uh, let's open up there and, and let the panelists kind of take it away for a little bit. I think one idea is the scalability. You know, we saw um, actuator properties all the way from proteins down at the protein level, potentially influencing behavior. And I want to, I guess, a, a question that's come up through the outside, um, the outside spreadsheet from from participants is is scalability uh, an issue for engineering actuators? How do we uh, how do we think about incorporating some of these protein level effects into into things that we can build? And is that even possible? And what are the challenges? Well, I, I know Songbei has some thoughts about this with like electro wedding microhydraulic actuators and stuff like that uh, out of Lincoln Labs. Um, but uh, I, so I, I would take a step back and, and say, um, you know, bio, bio inspiration is important. 
in robotics. We need inspiration. We need ideas to draw from in our design process. But I, I think you know the 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 level of bio inspiration that we really want to operate at is um, big ideas like oh the properties of your actuator are going to affect optimal control of your full system, right? But not um, our actuator must look just like the biological actuator or you know, any aspect of our, our machine should look just like biology, even when we're trying to replace a biological limb or assist a biological limb, that it's entirely possible to come up with better actuation uh, through engineering and design. We're not bound by the same uh, direct evolutionary process. And that can be useful. Also, obviously, it, you know, we're less good at doing some things that biology can do that are amazing, like grow very complicated structures. Uh, we, you know, we're limited in, in, in fabrication and assembly and some of the cool kinds of actuators we'd like to make. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so I'd say uh, it, it, it's something that, you know, we want to keep a good balance and where, where do we, uh, in, in, what, in what way do we draw inspiration by, from biology without trying to, um, being falling into the trap of exactly mimicking it. Yeah, I wonder if um, Kisa has ideas on this because I know that some of the properties that Jenna talked about today are things that you and your group have begun to try and implement in machines, especially prosthetic limbs. Um, can you say a little bit about, I guess, the directness of the analogy from what we see at the protein level to performance in machines um, that the engineers are collaborating with or building? Yeah, so I, I completely agree with Steve that there's a big difference between biomimicry and bioinspiration. And there's a lot of really good examples in biology of things you wouldn't want to emulate, like the peacock tail and like male peacocks are terrible at flying, right? but females like their big tails. <laughs> so you have to be very careful. And I also, you know, I totally appreciate, um, you know, I think like it's a really, um, you can't just slap biological ideas onto, uh, you know, um, um, human designed robots or wearable devices. You have to, like Tommaso Lenzi beautifully said in his talk, you've got to, um, you know, if you want to have a certain kind of control, then you've got to um, uh, design the, you know, the plant and the controller together. And so like one of the things we learned from our experience with, you know, trying to, and I would say what we did was more test our algorithm using a wearable device than try and actually make a wearable device better. And one of the big limitations was that the, the, the device, which happened to be, you know, the, um, Biome T2 wasn't designed to operate with our algorithm, but despite that fact, we were still able to achieve with no sensing, right? And no changes in parameters, no parameter control. We were able to achieve walking at variable speed and the, you know, the transition to and from level to stair walking and vice versa. And, um, and in fact, like the, we could show that the T2 doesn't do that. And I think somebody said early in, earlier in a talk today, I should go back and look at my notes, you know, that the, um, that the biome and the, you know, the, uh, the empower, which is the latest evolution of that, you know, that they're very biological in their function, but they're very biological in their function for walking at variable cadence and they don't, function well on slopes or, you know, transitioning to stairs. And so this adaptability is a big problem that um, I'm not saying that, you know, that, that adaptability should be, um, uh, you know, achieved in control through some biological mechanism, but I'm just saying that, you know, people who are interested in these problems of simplifying control and sort of morphological computation you know, might be interested in, you know, how biological systems do that and um, helping with the research enterprise of trying to figure that out. Yeah, I was wondering um, if uh, Songbei, you mentioned that, you know, your work's been moving from kind of more on the hardware side to thinking about 
uh, how to integrate control, especially in tasks like manipulation that might have different goals uh, than, than locomotion. So, so just to touch on what Kisa mentioned here, there is this duality that dynamic walking crowds talked about for a long time. Like what is the trade-off between uh, how much we can rely on mechanics to get stable motion versus, you know, uh, active in the loop control. And I, I just wondered uh, over your career, Sangbei, how have you thought about managing that duality? Like when do you decide to go hard on actuator versus hard on control design? Um, uh, the, my MIT career has been pretty simple, actually. Before I trying like all kinds of one-directory system, like composite material, like passive uh, uh, engineering, passive like mechanical uh, intelligence, things like that. But uh, ever since at MIT, we just uh, make actuator uh, as simple as possible, as high bandwidth as possible, so that we can freely apply our controller. So a lot of people ask me, where's your parallel spring? Where's your like tendon? Like, no, 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 we uh, make our actuator as light as possible. And then the transmission is as stiff as possible so you can execute the high bandwidth actuation. It's been pretty successful. Um, I'd like to uh, relate to what, what Steve says, like the, in terms of bio-inspiration. We find a lot of uh, differences along with some similarity uh, when it comes to muscle to actuator. Um, and we have to adapt the difference uh, when it comes to taking inspiration from animal. We, I study a lot of biomechanics uh, uh, literature, went to a lot of conferences. When I, when I take an inspiration, I have to have a very strong filter uh, that uh, allow me to selectively choose a, a certain aspects or inspiration that fit in our uh, engineering characteristic of actuator. Um, so if, if I answer uh, your question is actually we're pretty much uh, maximizing performance in the robotics, uh, the actual domain with as simple system as possible. So we can actually freely apply control. But I, I'd like to comment one thing about the uh, electric actu or engineering actuator versus muscle. Um, when it comes to power, a lot of people still may, may not know about it, electric motor uh, exceed the bio biological muscle by a factor of at least 100. 100 times powerful uh, electric motors are 100 more powerful than muscle. And, and what, like uh, the, uh, Steve was asked the question, which part we want to really mimic? I think the, uh, still the main, uh, the main thing we're missing in an, an engineering domain is the uh, force density with the minimum inertia. We cannot achieve a similar force level using like 200 gear ratio, 300 gear ratio, no, and then now no longer you can't control the force properly. Muscle in your, in your finger or your jaw is a small size muscle can generate uh, pretty high force, but very low power, but yet it can actually absorb energy very easily and the easy back drive because there are no, almost no inertia. That's basically what's missing in, in uh, our world. A lot of people, uh, you know, public ask us like, oh, where's your ankle? Where's your toes? We love to have ankle our quadrupedal robot. That's very expensive to build. Uh, here, expensive means that it's very complex, make a distal limb very heavy, control very difficult, sensing very difficult. Uh, degree of freedom is really expensive in the, in the robotics world. And yet the small high force actuator is, is a missing. So the, uh, uh, the Steve actually alluded to talk about this, but uh, the, we talked about scalability of the, this massive complex uh, issue. I mean, if you think about what is really fundamental source of force in the world, there are actually there are two, electrostatic and electromagnetic. In, in some physicists world, those are the same thing, but you know, engineering domain, we think is a different thing. And we believe that muscles are uh, operating under electrostatic, electric force uh, domain, not electromagnetic. And there's a, a massive difference between electrostatic and electromagnetic. Electromagnetic doesn't really need to be miniaturized and massively parallel like a muscle. Electrostatic actually have a huge benefit if you make it very, very small scale and then create a massive parallel system. That's where the manufacturing challenge comes from. So the high, you can look it up, a uh, micro hydraulic actuator from Lincoln Lab. They actually uh, the, solved a few key uh, challenges of making electrostatic actuator, which is a friction and then gap management and uh, under 20 micron, 30 micron level. And yet, and then if you look at the number, 
uh, it solved the, the traditional challenges of electrostatic actuator. And then if you scale up, it can exceed muscles and electric motor performance in terms of force density. Yet we can manufacture properly. We've been actually talking about how to manufacture for two years. We're still scratching our head. How can we create a microstructure, thousand layer, 2000 layer, uh, reliably operate properly. So I still think it's interesting to compare muscles and actuator because we, are, we still have a missing uh, kind of domain, missing area in the performance domain and, and compare the nodes. Uh, and at some point we might be able to have a build the prosthetics with the toes wiggling and then each toe can lift yourself up. So I think right. ongoing challenging and uh, challenging discussions. Right on. So Songbei, um, I, I like I entirely agree with uh, all, all that you're saying about the important challenges in actuator design going forward. Um, and also the, the strengths of the existing actuators. Uh, here's a question. Do you think that if we could take uh, the nervous system of an animal and connect it to the actuators of a robot, we could perform better than our current robot controllers. I, I, my sense is that the answer is yes, right? Our, our uh, animal nervous systems are so much better at handling these complex control problems and learning how to, to work with whatever system changes you get. Um, but I don't know, I'm not sure. And uh, cer certainly it feels like on the, in the prosthetics and exoskeletons world, when we try to um, design a better device, yeah, you know, the actuators we have are sufficient that we could, we can do well. And the problem's all on the control side, uh, both in control of our devices and in understanding the nervous system's control of the rest of the body that we're interacting with. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, um, I don't know enough about our nervous system. I don't believe we actually understand the whole nervous system, but you know, I think the locomotion is difficult too, but the, when it comes to manipulation, it's a lot clearer. We, we constantly talking about uh, how much we can do with the one degree freedom gripper, like a tongue, like we can control. Our intelligence is beyond like the motor control level. We understand the interaction between object a lot better. Uh, and yet our one degree freedom gripper uh, robot cannot even do a really simple thing, rudimentary thing. So I, I think a lot of people ask like, oh, is our robots are limited by actuator or limited with the controller? I think it's like still 99% controller is limited. And then we're not talking about, you know, FQMA or, or tracking or force control level. We're talking about much higher level, like understanding uh, common sense, understanding the high level intelligence. We have absolutely no idea how to code. Will you take a comment from the peanut gallery? Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Um, I, I, you know, I, I always think the animals do incredible things, and the robots don't. And it's and, and motors are good actuators, and computers are very fast, and so it's hard to it's hard to blame um, the hardware. Um, but there is a there is one big difference besides the control system, which is the sensing. Um, and I and I think people, for example, don't walk very well when they when you take away a lot of their sensors. And I think uh, making a good controller without without uh, much more force feedback than most of us are used to thinking about in our controllers, um, it might it might uh, it's not it's not just the nerve system. I think the muscles are you know motors are pretty good muscles, like Sangbai has always said, and I agree. And I think um, computers are pretty fast, but I think there's uh, compared to brains, um, but the sensing most of us don't have a very elaborate force sensing. It's not that you need millions of touch sensors maybe, but we don't even know the, the torques and forces on the feet, for example, and the forces that are manipulating fingers. We don't know those. That, that's not put into our control systems very well yet. So, yeah, I was just gonna follow up on what Andy's saying that, you know, the sensor side, like you can have an actuator and you can have a control law, but your control law typically needs to be informed by some sensor. Uh, unless it's a completely open loop. And it seems like in biology, you know, reflexes in some ways serve this purpose where the, the actuator, as, as Keith has mentioned, is, has some activation dependence uh, in its state vector. And that activation comes from, is reactive. It comes from sensors. So I, I feel like um, there's some innovation to be had in, 
in developing actuators with onboard sensing that, that can be reactive and sort of switch the impedance mode of the actuator quickly, potentially. Thoughts on that? So can I jump in for a minute? Um, you know, so I guess I wanna um, just say something about like morphological computation. Um, you know, I think that like ideas about, you know, that muscles and control are, are evolving. And, you know, there's a, there's still a huge um, conflation of, you know, like EMG with muscle force. Um, but, you know, in Monica's, we all have the intuition that, um, uh, you know, like, there's the intuition, you know, of banjo players or piano players, you know, like you just, you just let your muscles go and, and learning to do um, complicated things well is kind of getting the brain out of the way. And when you step in a hole, you don't know the, you know, you don't know <laughs> that that's about to happen. And Monica's birds stepping in the hole have no idea. And so neither feedback nor, you know, sort of feed forward um, control is at play. And what is at play is morphological computation, right? And so I don't know how you go about building that into a robot, but I do think like, um, you know, and this whole, one of the themes from earlier this morning and the talks earlier, earlier this morning was, um, you know, about mitigating instability and that you have to have instability in order to change behaviors. And so like, I think like, so, so one of the things that morphological computation does is it really allows you to have like a zero delay control of instability, you know, to management of instability. And so I think, you know, like one of the keys to having more, you know, like animal-like um, uh, versatility and um, adaptability is, you know, trying to move away from these, you know, sort of like, you know, sensing and reacting to just interacting in the right way. Yeah, those are, those are all great points. Uh, we are, so, this is an amazingly short period of time for, for the amount of knowledge in the room, but we do, the idea of here was to get people's brains moving so that when we enter spatial chat for posters, we can follow up and have conversations like these that, that go, get longer and more open-ended um, when you're in your groups and spatial chat. So I'm gonna encourage us to do that. Uh, there, there's an interesting question in the chat, which I think I'll leave us with before we you switch over to the spatial chat and go to posters. And it sort of flips the idea that what, why are we always so focused on um, observing biology and trying to incorporate some of those ideas into our machines? What can we actually learn from machines about biology? And so this idea of, of robophysics or building robots um, to, to tackle biological questions that may not be measurable, for example, is, a, is, a, is a, another cool thing to think about in, in this crowd. Okay, so I think with that, um, we'll close the panel. People, we'll, we'll, we can paste the spatial chat information for the posters in, in the chat here and, and head over there. Take a quick break if you need it. There are, I think, nine or 10 rooms set up with posters. The poster presenters should be there putting their posters up now. Um, there's also a couple kind of open rooms where people can convene and catch up with each other. Uh, and, and have and have some fun discussions. And that spatial chat, you know, the meeting formally ends at 5.30, but the spatial chat never closes. So you can feel free to stay there as long as you like. Um, it's open for 500 participants uh, throughout the rest of the day. And uh, we'll see you hopefully in a month at episode two. We can tune these up as we go, take this as a learning experience and come back and, and do it again in, in a few weeks. All right, thanks to the panelists thanks. and thanks for the great talks today. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Kisa, Sangbei, everybody. Thank you, everyone. See you in spatial chat. All right, everyone. Thank you so much, and I encourage everyone to go over spatial chat. It is now in the in, in the chat log. Uh, if Hi. You can, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you. We can. Is someone speaking? They'd like to hear. Hello. Okay. All right. It might have been speaking to spatial, spatial chat. It's very hard to juggle these two programs at one time. Yeah, it's fine. Hey, uh, Greg, uh, you, I, I, uh, no, so you're doing fine, Chris. It's Greg's uh, microphone we got to fix. <laughs>
Yeah, I have. You hear an echo, but it seems man. like. Do you guys all hear an echo from me? It's just a little right bit. Now, it? It's boomy. It's boomy. It's, it's, it's like not too it's, bad. No. it's like if you're in a bathroom uh, a little bit, you know. It's, it's, Andy's just teasing you. No, no, I, I think like to me, it's listen. Uh, no. Sam's got a great mic. Steve's got a great mic. It's, it's so much please. To me, you're listening to this all day long. The echo like sort of grates on me. Yeah, I got to buy. I actually don't have a um, peripheral mic hooked up. And if you have, if you just have, if you have a, it. that's probably it. Well, I, I bought the the pleasing to Andy model mic. Uh, that's what I did. That's that's how I knew uh, that. That's what this is. You can find it or, or get a Mac. Mac's Mac microphone is fantastic. We actually did a huge competition with the Mac mic, and they they loved it. <laughs> no, just see the iPhone. The iPhone uh, earbuds are very good. Just yeah. you can plug the okay. iPhone earbud is good. You don't even need that one. Just see normal earbuds for a phone are very good. Oh yeah. yeah. Apple products are good. Yeah. My, no. the, or normal earbuds for any phone are very good. The basic. Yes. It's like any the worst microphone close to your mouth is better than the best microphone far from your mouth. Yeah, I should just buy a, a peripheral mic. I, I think um, folks, I checked with folks from my from my group who are listening in, and and it does, maybe they're just used to hearing me echo for the last year, and it doesn't bother them anymore. But but um, it's definitely a thing. I'm also in a room that doesn't have very much in it. And there is an echo, like I hear an echo around myself. Oh, so I, yeah, I don't, <laughs> so I don't hear that's probably room. part of it. Yeah, you, you have a special I mean, room. But yeah, you sound your mouth, like you're in a bit of a tunnel. Put your mouth right yeah. next to your computer and see how it sounds. Hello, 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 hello. This sounds that's better. That's much better. Yeah, I just need to get a microphone and put it next to my mouth or one of those headsets. If you, yeah. do, if you do a lousy headset like this also, just the microphone is really good. It is, okay. I, any, anything close to that is good. Yeah. Cost 10 bucks. Yeah. You need to also do this with a top right, radio guys, thing. I'm going to... You know. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Well, I, lo I like the... Uh, I probably will spend more and get one that looks cool. That like looks Steve's, like Steve's got like a Yeti Blue or something, and Chris, had, <laughs> yeah. Chris, has, Chris has the uh, $200 one. It's really good. Steve looks like he's broadcasting from a radio station. I know it sounds cool. great though. It's perfect sound system. Yep. Um, uh, guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this program and go to spatial chat. Hopefully, some of you will join. Yep. Um, I'll go there too. See you there. See you I'd there. See everyone there. Bye. We'll be closing out Bye. this room. So take care. Goodbye, YouTube. Bye. See you, Ryan.